Hey, bud. So we're back. Yes, we are. Thank you for coming back down. That's not a problem. Just just a a short drive. Uh, yeah. So last time we were talking about ideas that you know kind of broke our brain, broke our conception of the universe, right? Well, we didn't finish all the things that we could have. No, we did not. No. Uh, to be fair, even what we're going to talk about today isn't the entire list, but it is some of the big ones. So to really quickly, right, last time we talked, we talked about how science is kind of this ever-evolving process of removing the things that we didn't realize were assumptions that we kind of just took for granted into our equations that didn't apply in other places. For example, Galileo, he realized that, hey, there's atmosphere that's accounting for some behavior if you, to more accurately represent what's going on, you need to say what happens when there is no atmosphere. And that challenged our idea of how things should move when they're falling, right? Heavy objects versus light objects. When we had uh, Einstein, we realized, he, he said, no, in fact, the fact that you're measuring the same speed of light at every point, no matter how you look at a light source, that means that instead of light changing like most waves that we've encountered would instead time and space shift around in order to make sure that that measurement of light being light at uh, in the vacuum at all reference frames is true. And then of course we talked about how Bell with his, um, his theorem showed that, you know what, maybe we're stuck with the problems that quantum mechanics has. Maybe the fuzziness that's inherent in the theory is there and you can't explain it with some deeper theory that some sharp, deeper theory that's hidden that maybe we could get to at some point. And so now there's another thing that we're going to have to run into because it turns out that quantum mechanics just being fuzzy isn't the only conceptually difficult part about quantum mechanics. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, instead, so, so each, each of those kind of, each of those theories leading up to the discoveries in the 20th century, um, we had a very strong opinion about how the role of the observer worked, right? Y you and I measuring data were kind of the final arbiter of whatever the observation would be on, you know, our measuring stick or whatever. But it turns out relativity and quantum mechanics really challenged that. Now, in the theory of relativity, there's a smooth transform that say, you know, if one observer sees something and you're moving, say, 20% of the speed of light past and, and look at the same thing, you will see a different sequence of events if they aren't um, space-like separated. Well, there's a transform that makes sure that says that, okay, you, we can take what you see and mathematically smoothly transform it to what I would see and say, oh, look, these things agree. Quantum mechanics. Lorentz transform. Yeah, Lorentz transform. Um, for the for relativity, that's that's how you make one reference frame equivalent, so that it would see the same thing as another reference frame. Um, quantum mechanics is going to be a bit different because quantum mechanics uh, has a bit of a split personality, and it leads to two two um, problems and a thought, uh, rather a, a named problem and a thought experiment that have been known basically since its inception. inception. First up, it's something, the, the, the problem is something called the measurement problem. So the mathematics of quantum mechanics, um, the way that waveforms evolve in time, are determined continuously and deterministically. They, they, they follow a nice differential equation. And even if I you know, can't pick the result that I would get, the, the path that the waveform will cover is deterministic and continuous. Where it gets... Difficult is the moment that I try to measure a quantum mechanical system. When I try to measure a quantum mechanical system, we, we talked a little bit about this. We talked about how the system collapses. And as far as that's concerned, that's stochastic, meaning it's random. It is non-continuous. And we don't necessarily have the operators describe how a that collapse and measurement is done. Okay. Now, why is that a problem? Well, the dueling interpretations lead to something um, 
known as Vigner, the Vigner's friend, basically one of the inventors of, or one of the original people who worked on quantum mechanics, thought up a, a thought experiment that showed that two people, depending on the situations that were placed in, would disagree on how a collapse in measurement would happen, or rather whether a collapse and a measurement was taken place, whether that occurred or not. Now, let me stop you for a second. You keep using the word collapse. I don't think we've fully expounded on what that actually means. Absolutely. So in order to do that, what we're going to have to do is learn quantum mechanics. Oh. Yeah. So uh, the most important thing is we're, let's go over what are the postulates. How does one, because last time I talked about how quantum mechanics was a, was a theory that you could uh, put forth a certain number of assumptions and from there build out the entire theory. So, let's go ahead and do that. Let's look at the postulates of quantum mechanics. Yes. All right. So, um, I'm stealing my thing from, uh, oh, no, ooh, these are all <laughs> previous notes when I was scribbling to make sure that I could write on this properly. Uh, all right. So, we're going to have some postulates. Let's see if I can spell properly. That's always been a problem of mine. So, first, a dynamic system, so any system where I want to know how it behaves, is going to correspond to what we will call a Hilbert space. So a Hilbert space is a fancy math term. Basically, uh, it, it, it is a mathematical th uh, object that let that is a collection of vectors uh, objects that I can choose that all behave that all follow uh, I believe it's like eight different different rules on how they transform how they add think about how the rules on you know when I did basic algebra how do you know how do I take two numbers and add uh, add them or multiply them or how do I take care of when I do add addition and multiplication at the same time right the those kinds of rules are defined for the Hilbert space and the object that you put in there um, and actually dynamic system are we contrasting that with static system yeah so so a dynamic system is if if I have to, to bring it to classical terms, if I have a ball that's just sitting on, or if I have a picture, just a single picture, there's no point in trying to predict what's happening, right? All the information's there and nothing about it will ever change once I just describe that thing. Uh, what's interesting is if I, instead of looking at the picture, I look at what, the, what system, let's say a ball on a hill, what uh, look at that instead and what happens as I push the ball, right? I, if I have a picture, I can't really move the ball and I can't ask how will it change based on how I put how I push it around. But if I'm actually looking at the dynamic system of a ball on a hill, I can be like, hmm, how will this ball roll down a hill? The right. classic physics question. Um, so dyna dynamic system is basically uh, just a fancy way of saying systems that we're going to be interested in looking at, things that will change with time because we change with time and we watch the world around us change with time, right? Okay. Um, so dynamics are an important point. Uh, so any system that you're going to be interested in is going to correspond to a whole space of these possible vectors. These vectors we will denote like this. And this is uh, each vector, uh, which we'll call a wave function or a state function. Um, this corresponds to a to to a definite state of the system. Um, so, in the ball rolling down the hill, in a ball rolling down the hill example, this would be okay. I know that the ball is three centimeters down the hill, moving at ten meters per second. Uh, in the northerly direction. Basically, I know everything about the system whenever I specify what state it is in. And then the question is, okay, from that state, how will it evolve into other possible states? Classical mechanics would say, okay, if I know where the ball is and how fast is it moving, can I predict where the ball will be in 10 seconds? Right. 
the same thing. Effectively, the same thing is going to be here. If I know, if if I could know the quantum mechanical state that this that this you know atomic system is in, can I figure out how it that that probability distribution will evolve in time over the possible you know, measurements that I could have? Um, so a definite state is just going to be a slice in time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the thing that I'm going to request require is that if I do this fancy operation, that I get one. Now, the the interpretations of this, which we'll get to in a later postulate, is going to be that these are probabilities, um, because it is, in fact, um, quantum mechanics, and this is how the mathematics works. But it's important that for quantum mechanics to work properly, that you can normalize these things. They're, that, that you could have some amount of locality to it. Make sense? Okay. And just I so can, the audience... I can, I, can, I can define a space where I will find the particle or whatever I'm looking at inside there somewhere. That's what this is saying. Okay. Right? If, if, I, if I look inside my system and ask, where is, the, is it in a state? It'll be in a state. It would be the same as saying, okay, I look for the ball on the hill. I have to find it somewhere on the hill. If I couldn't do this, this would be saying, okay, the ball can go infinitely far away. There's no distance that I could stop and say, aha, the ball must be within this, right? Okay, so you're saying that by... Well, actually, you've said a couple things here that I want to make sure mm -hmm. uh, we're understanding. Uh, one of them is you use the word normalize. Mm -hmm. So for the audience's benefit, normalize means that you are limiting the range of possible values to be between zero and one. Right. So, um, the, because this is a probability, right? You're trying to do probability. Technically you could have, uh, I, I suppose you could make sense to have probabilities between zero and some maximum, but it's most convenient to talk about probabilities between zero and one, because that's an easy translation between that and percentages, right? Whenever, whenever, if I'm, if I'm, <laughs> If I'm running, uh, you know, off to Las Vegas trying my luck, I want to know, you know, I have a a 35% chance of winning this hand in a poker game or something, right? I don't want to have to go, okay, there are 45 ways out of the 126,000 ways, right, that this hand will win me the game, right? Uh, it's it's a measure of convenience, and then we just kind of built that into our math. So it would be 0.35? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And are you going to explain operators a little bit further? Um, yeah, so okay. uh, in in an abstract sense, we'll get there. Sure. Okay. Um, although feel free to specify any questions. So second, um, an isolated system, right? So if I have no outside influence, then the way that a system will evolve is going to be according to the Schrodinger equation. And by evolve, we're talking about how will it change in time. So if I know the system is in some state, then the Schrodinger equation is going to be So what this is saying is that the, the, is there a highlighter? Yeah, we'll use this. Um, no, we'll do this. Okay. What we're saying is that the, Ooh, mm, your first color. Look at me. I did use colors last time. Uh, so, so the time derivative of the state, basically, how is this thing changing in time? is going to be related by a constant and the Hamiltonian of the system we're defining. So in classical mechanics, the way that we have understood it is that you can get a complete picture of, every, of everything that's happened. You can derive your equation of state very easily. If you have um, this, this quantity, which we'll call that, which is called the Hamiltonian, that describes for you two, uh, uh, one very important thing: how much how much energy is in the system. And usually, the way that we denote this is that we talk about 
um, potential energy, the energy that is there based on the forces that the system can be can experience, and the kinetic energy. How fast are the pieces in that system moving? Right. So in the analogy of the ball uh, of the ball on the hill, the classic is that, you know, the kinetic energy would just be how fast is the ball moving be related to deriv time derivatives. And the potential will be a description that mathematically captures how the, the shape of the hill and how that shape will cause the ball to move because of gravity. Right. If I have a, if I have a ball that's higher up on the hill it's going to be able to by the time it gets down to the bottom be moving faster than if i had it only halfway up that same hill regardless of the shape of the hill right um but if there are things like you know friction stealing away from that energy that too would be considered in the potential right so it's a question of how much energy can i have um, and that's, this leads us, right? So I've, I've obviously, I, you know, we've, I've given a time derivative on this, but I've just said, oh, okay, this thing, uh, acting on this thing. But what, what does that mean? Well, H here, uh, plays the role of what's called an operator. So an operator is just, um, since what I described as the Hilbert space is made up of vectors, an operator, um, in this case, can be thought of, of as matrices, but it's it's a, 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 a basically a function that takes you from one vector in the Hilbert space to another. That's it. So from X to Y. Right. So if I had, right, um, let's do this. Um, let's say, so to, to bring our attention a little bit. Let's say my Hilbert space uh, is comprised of all, actually, let's choose a different color. Ooh, it's dry pink. All the different rays that I could um, have coming out from the origin. Right? So uh, I could let's say, Nate, uh, label them, right? So then I could talk about how my, let's say my, my, my quantum mechanical state is in ray one, okay? Uh, an operator, uh, for example, let's say, I'll call it the shift operator, which basically takes in and gives you out, yeah, and, and then let's say plus two. So an operator effectively has two functions. It will give you, so, and then let's apply that rule on our initial state here, this one guy there. What this would give me would give me one times the state three, according to the rule that I just defined here. Um, it will, so an operator will give you another state in the space that you have, it, 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 it could be the same one, it could be a different one, and it'll give you some scalar number that's attached to it, right? So an important thing about a vector is that it has a length and a direction, right? So you can, uh, it, it's, it's got encoded information beyond just the counting that I can do. There's, there's you know, uh, if I wanted to... Uh, it's it's the difference between telling you, oh, okay, it'll take 30 minutes to get to Starbucks versus saying, okay, you need to travel 10 minutes up north for, and then 20 minutes east to get to Starbucks. Right? There's extra information that's contained in a vector versus just a single number that I say to you. Um, yeah. So if I throw a ball, the vector indicates the direction, but also the magnitude is going to be... Yeah. velocity yes so so yeah if you if you throw a ball you can represent its velocity as vector that would get be how fast is it going and in what direction is it going but then i would talk about how, well the speed is just how fast is it going it's a, it's a scalar uh any operator that you pref that you put onto a vector will give you those two things will give you back another vector and it'll give you some scalar that it's multiplying by okay and in fact um the third postulate do that oh Ooh. 
apparently. What kind of physics are we doing here? Still trying to figure out the physics of a single app. That's what. <laughs> it's the best. Okay. Back to three. So, postulate three. Any observable of a system. So, basically, anything that I could measure. Nope. Oh, first typo. <laughs> I'm very good at this. Oh, cerebrals. Oh, cerebrals. <laughs> oh, I did not know you could rotate in place like that. That's... Didn't rotate it. I squished it. You squished it? Okay. There we go. Don't worry. I've taught many times. And uh... What operator was that? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a thing. Uh, 3D rotations are a set of vectors and uh, observables that you can have. So, any observable things that I could things that I could measure. So, what we'll call measurables. No, there isn't in there, isn't there? Now, are these in any way correlated with beables from our last talk? Uh, or is beable a subset of observable? Uh, I believe observable is actually a subset of beable. Oh, okay. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, observables are just going to be things that I could measure about the system. So, like, for example, ball rolling down the hill, I could uh, observe its position. I could observe its momentum. Uh, in a classical system, I could observe its color, for example. It doesn't necessarily have to be something... Um, it, you know, you can be creative. Now, of course, your physical system doesn't care, you know, a ball on a hill doesn't care whether the ball is red or blue. So you might come up with obs with observables that aren't actually matterful. Um, so observables here are going to be associated with what are called Hermitian operators. Right on the Hilbert space uh, that we are talking about, which I will denote as a fancy H here. Now, we'll get to what these are here. Uh, what we then assume is that the what we'll call the eigenstates. So, and that the eigenstates of any observable that you want are complete which basically means any possible measurement any re any result that i could get from a measurement is represented in these eigenstates okay so an eigenstate is any possible measurement that could occur um no no uh you, so or the result of any measurement so for here what we're here what we're just saying is that uh eigenstates um, the, the, the fundamental, uh, vectors that you can use to describe your, the operator that is your observable. Spin up, spin down. Right. Uh, are able to capture all possible values, um, that that ob observation could have. Right. So basically, um, to bring this to that classical, I don't want to have a region where the ball could go that my eigenstates for for position couldn't describe right i don't want to have you know let you know let's say everywhere to the left of where uh, uh to the left two feet to the left of the bottom being undescribable by the mathematics right we assume that there's a way we have we have to have a way mathematically to describe what those uh are uh, to describe what those posi those positions that makes sense. Okay, so uh, put another way, let's say eigenstate is going to be. Let me construct an eigenstate here on this table. So the positions between my hand, mm -hmm. this would be one eigenstate in any possible location in here. Uh, just along one yeah, line yeah. would be. Uh, any possible value could be in there is an eigenstate. Yeah, so I want uh, the the assumption is is that the math that we have for our operators is enough to describe any of the possible positions between your hands, right? So if all, all of a sudden you know this region between my hands wasn't describable, we would have a bad time. 
uh, basically assume and hope that our math is good enough that it, that if I'm describing, I've got the right operator, and then I will always, you know, mathematically be able to predict everything in here. And if we don't, then we have to work on the theory. And so far, uh, that hasn't been a problem. Um, next, if I want to take a measurement of an observable, right? Uh, let's say some observable A, right? This could just be anything. Uh, an important point, actually, jumping back to three, there are observables and Hermitian operators in quantum mechanics that correspond to any classical operation that you would be interested in, whether it's position, momentum, kinetic and potential energy. These things have corollaries in quantum mechanics. Basically, the idea is, you know, I can measure on this scale, this certain quantity. I should be able to measure that same thing quantum mechanically. I should be able to measure that thing on the microscopic world. Okay. So if I want to uh, make a measurement, what I'm going to get is that operator. Let's use the proper little uh, notation. On some state vector will give me a scalar back and that state vector. Basically, whenever I have, uh, whenever I do an observation, I should have the only the only results of this are going to be solutions to what are called the eigenvector and eigen uh, state equation. So um, maybe we'll get into linearity on this, but basically there are a collection, right, of, and, and this is where we get to what we were talking about with the eigenstates and such, is that there's a collection of i's, maybe countable, maybe not, where i can be some number one, two, up to uh, potentially infinite, but yeah, um, where a acting on that eigenstate will give you a, a, a specific associated number, this lambda i, and that same eigenstate back. Right, so the idea is, is right, if, uh, and this goes back to what we were talking about, it, where it, the eigenstates have to be complete, so if I, because quantum mechanics says that if I measure, make a measurement, the, me, the, the only thing I can get are these eigenstates. So the only possible results that I could get, get to it in a moment, are eigens, uh, values of the operator. Okay, things that solve this particular equation. And eigenvalue, that's, that's lambda? Yeah, so the eigenvalues would be this, and like we said, the eigenstates were these, this i here. Okay, if, if I want to know and predict what the average quantity, postulate five, average quantity of some observable, right, the way that I would do that mathematically, which, would be this way, right? The way that I do it is I take my operator acting on state function, do that nice little smashing uh, with what we'll call a ket. All right, basically, I, I take the state that I'm interested in, flip it over and smash them together. Like what we said here, if it's normalizable, this equals one. So this will end up just looking right like this. So let's let's pull five up to the center as soon as you get him written out. Yeah. And if you don't mind, can we while you're going through this, can we assign an actual real thing to observable A? Like can we call this 
for an example, like position, or yeah. can we call this momentum or spin or something like that? Yeah. So if I want to know, um, let's say, hmm, what would be an appropriate thing? I mean, yeah. So so this this can be any of those. This could be the energy. This could be, um, you know, uh, this could be that position. So let's say I had. Quantum mechanically, I described that you know the ball, uh, the ball hill system was like this. Then, if I want to know the energy, right? Then the postulate five tells me that there is some energy that, for this state, gives me back like that. And so, what I would say, and this is a scalar number that doesn't care about the Brockett notation. So if I wanted to say, let's say, hmm. yeah, if I wanted to know what is the average energy across all possible positions, basically, right? Let's say that this encapsulate the ball anywhere um, in your system. Then the way that I would do this following postulate five would be Take this and then hit it, right? Ooh. There you go. All right. With this state function, but f with the arrow flipped over, right? Um, Which arrow flipped over? This, this little here. Okay, so right. the guy on the left being bra and the guy on the right being cut. Yeah, which in bracket notation is that. Uh, effectively, you've got, whenever you've got a vector space, you've got a dual vector space um, that when you match them together will give you a scalar number. Um, but that's Pull more... Pull him up to the center. I more think mathematical. Little... Oh, down here? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's fair. All right, so whenever you're dealing with, with uh, vectors... Um, you know, when I, whenever I talked about with a classical system, we talked about a vector, how it had, you know, the scalar information, how fast it was going, and also directional information. So you want to have some mathematical way to get to the scalar information. For the language that we've just established here, um, that is basically taking whatever vector you have, which we'll call a bra, and hitting it with its dual, um, and together, the associated dual will give you a scalar number. It'll give you a single number that has no information about the directionality uh, or anything else. Uh, okay, so let's elaborate a little bit on that. So I have a state, which mm -hmm. you're representing with psi, right? Mm -hmm. And I operate on it. And so what I would pull out at that point would be, let's let's say I'm I'm... I've thrown a ball in this direction, right? So my eigenstate is this direction, the trajectory of the ball. Mm -hmm. And I want to know how fast it's going. So when I operate on it, I can basically pull out what the this, this speed is, not the direction, because I, I was already measuring on that. Right. Okay. So when you have uh, multiple... When you have multiple vectors or multiple dual vectors uh, interacting with each other, it can get complicated. So the way that we find our average quantities is that whenever um, an operator comes in and acts on the state, remember what we said before, an operator on a vector will give you a different vector or it will give you some vector and some scalar, right? Uh, for this, what we said is that whenever I have the result of an observable, whenever I do something that I can take a measurement on, quantum mechanics gives me a solution to the eigenstate. So it gives me back the same eigenstates, or the, same, the, the same state, and then some scalar number attached to it. In this case, we call that scalar number e. Now, that scalar number can, because of the different, because of how scalars interact with vectors, can be moved around um, the this you know three factor system any way that we want. So I can take this e and put it to the outside and end up with this. So now I have e. And then these two guys interact together. Well, what did we say that that this guy was? Well, oh wait a minute. By definition, I remember this guy was one. It's equal to one. So if I want to take 
uh, the, you know, if I want to be able to, in my math, describe how to find an average, like the average measurement of energy or the average position that a particle will be in, this is mathematically the symbolism that we will use. Um, you take your vectors and you hit them with the associated dual vector. Now, the the details about how you find these dual vectors, they, they, they match one to one and it's all, it's all nice and dandy with quantum mechanics, but it's more in detail than I think uh, anyone but a professional or a crazy person will find interesting. Crazy That's our target audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, ugh, goodness. Do you want to add five more hours to this conversation? <laughs> Maybe not today. <laughs> we might get to it later. Uh, all right. So whenever I want to find, you know, an average quantity, I take a state vector and divide there. And this just allows me, if I haven't normalized, this is the way that I can make sure that I get percent, uh, yeah, percentages of like maximum quantities and stuff. All right, postulate six. Yeah, postulate six. Let me. Yeah. So if I have some operator. Operator observable. Let's just it's it's a arbitrary operator. An important point. An a uh, an observable is an operator that w what we mentioned before. Actually, let me go back and uh, point this out now that we've talked a little bit about it. And I called it a Hermitian operator. And basically, that's a fancy term too. It's guaranteed to always have a real number result for that scalar number that comes out. Uh, because in quantum mechanics, uh, if you actually like very quickly start trying to deal with the math, what you find is that complex numbers are going to be the natural language for this. But obviously, whenever I'm trying to count like things in the real world, like how many objects are on here, I don't know what to do with you know. There's you know five objects and one imaginary object. Five plus one and one imaginary. I, I don't know what to do with that. I can't interpret that in a physical sense. So what we demand is that we that the results of observations of measurements map to things I can make physical sense of, things that are real numbers uh, at worst, maybe even just um, If I count my numbers. fingers, it's never going to be one times square root of negative one. Exactly. Right. Right. We don't know what square root of negative one would look like if I'm you know, touching things. So now that being said, postulate six is more... Uh, abstract than that. It doesn't necessarily have to be an observable. So an operation well. Basically giving people quantum mechanics undergrad. Oh yeah. In about an hour. Oh yeah. Like this, this is awesome. <laughs> I mean this is this is at least um mm, two weeks. Three weeks of <laughs> Liliana's and undergrad. However many months it takes to actually sink in and have yeah. The rest, the, rest of, with it. the rest of it is, here's a bunch of examples so that you can actually learn what any, any of this means. <laughs> so audience, uh, sorry, I don't expect you to <laughs> remember this for the test. Well, that's the beauty of YouTube. They can always pause it and so replay. Good. So if I have some arbitrary ar uh, operator A, right, with eigenstates, goodness, I need to be less hasty when I'm drawing these things, I suppose. Oops. Phi i and the associated eigenvalues lambda i, then what the 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 quantity? And just so we're clear with your notation, that i is supposed to be a subscript. Yes. Okay. Uh, this denotes, like we said, that i could be you right. know it could be one, two. Goodness, I have to there's not actually two scalars sitting there. Right. Uh, it's 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 just. A way of saying, you know, I, I can talk about the ball being here or the ball being there or the ball being here or the ball being there, right? Many, many different possibilities. This is a way of saying, okay, each of those, each of those positions would map to a vector and then we're just going to label them in a counted way. You know, it's uh, ironic. I don't think we've actually ever explained so far why quantum mechanics is actually called quanta. You're not wrong. And you're actually kind of showing it right there. Uh yes and no now technically this so so yeah uh the like 
this was partially discovered by Planck and realized that in order to beat the ultraviolet catastrophe that he needed to say, oh, photons can only have this multiple of a number in their energy. Uh, and uh, then from there, Einstein realized that, you know, how much energy got kicked off from shining light on the metal was associated with this number ended up being called Planck's constant because it's so important. And yeah, we'll actually get into there. But so, so what that kind of implied is that I could count the stages of energy instead of it being a continuous spectrum. Now, that being the case, there are, um, there are measurements, for example, like if I were to describe quantum mechanically, the position of a ball and a well bouncing back and forth, right? That's a, that's a fun elementary example. Uh, that have what's called a continuous spectrum. So you can't actually count, you can't come up with a, f a countably infinite basis for the different positions. Technical term. But basically, it's, 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 it's smeared. Now, quantum mechanics has the way to deal with that, but a lot of this kind of deals with... Well, actually, I mean, it's just... Instead of this, it would be, you know... We would, we would denote this as being in a range from zero to some impossible states. As opposed to picking from a set. Right. As, right. Opposed, as opposed to like clear countable numbers, it would just be like, ah, it's, it's, it's any number you choose between zero and n, and not just the, the ones that you can count. Uh, and that gets messy, but eh, we'll leave the mathematicians to figure out <laughs> the difference you. between the difference. <laughs> Only partially me. <laughs> so uh, for any, any operator... With a with a specified eigenstates and specify and said eigenvalues, right? These guys here. Then, what I'm going to interpret this guy, right? Uh, the state of a system hit with the ket associated with some eigenstate. This is going to be a a what's the exact term? Yeah, this is a probability amplitude. what does that mean? Well, that means the quantity basically this thing squared will tell me the probability of probability works. <laughs> oh goodness. It's fine. Ah, uh, yeah. I should just shorten this and just say prob, but whatever. All right. So the probability of when I, whenever I make a measurement of of a, of a getting the associated eigenvalue of that eigenstate, right? So basically. Uh, quantum mechanical states, you could be, right, if, if I don't know that the system is in an eigenstate, what I can do is I can hit it and ask it, okay, what's the probability that you, that, uh, what, what's the probability that I will find you in the eigenstate with energy of, say, one half or something, or two thirds, right? What is the probability of finding that energy is described by this object here? Make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And then finally and lastly, rule seven. Oh, I thought there were eight. No. You looked at my notes and it's a, that's a quirk of the thing. There's only seven. Ha ha, I've tricked you. Yes, you have. All right. So... Let's say I take a measurement of A. So I take a measurement of energy, or I take a measurement of position, and it gives me the result of one, one of the choices that I have. Like It tells me, oh, okay, you've got the energy state with one half, or you've got the position of two feet down the road. Okay? Then... If the initial um, system was in this state, 
right? What's this vector? Then what that measurement does is it projects your system into one of, uh, into, actually, excuse me. Um, so this is, here we go. All right. Where this guy is a specific element of your Hilbert space. It will project your system into the eigenstate associated with that um, eigenvalue, and it will, will push your Hilbert space that you could possibly see from the whole thing down to the subsystem, the subspace that is associated with lambda i. So this thing is going to be strictly smaller than your full Hilbert space. Okay, so, uh, so explain that without maybe so much mathematical terms. Like, I've, I've got a, let's say I've got just a simple thing, mm -hmm. X, Y, Z location, and that's my Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is, is I've now constrained by doing this, I've made the measurement, I've now down to just X or Y or Z. So... Let's say hmm, one of the easiest ones is like the example of the infinite well, right? Nice. Uh, if I have an infinite well, then by the <laughs> mathematics I could I can describe basically uh, are going to be sine functions that fit within here. So I could have, say, this would be an eigenstate. This would be an eigenstate. I should go down deeper, but whatever. And then let's see if we can get. Imagine those are much smoother, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that I prepare the system so that it is in a linear combination of all three. So that basically, let's go there, that my psi is going to be equal to, we'll just call them one, two, It's so fancy that I just can't keep up with it, right? Uh, so then this is one, two, three. So what happens when I measure H on this is that to perform a measurement effectively mathematically, what we'll do is pick one of these. So the result, like I, I look at this is my ask, okay, how much energy is in this infinite square? Well, and let's say it picks and tells me that I get, let, let's say that the energy is associated just one, two, three. So it tells me that I have energy of state one. What happens then is that now my system, if I go away and then ask again, how much energy is in the system. Whereas before, I could get one, two, or three with the way that I've set it up, equal probability. Now, having going back to measure it again, I will get one back, no matter how many times I ask the system, what energy are you in? Okay, so and, you, you asked the infinite well. The infinite well said, hey, I have a bunch of waveforms mm -hmm. denoted one, two, and three, and my answer is one. Now the next time I go ask that infinite well again, it's always going to say one. It's yes. just going to just going to toss the same answer back. But like, it's one, 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 one. If I have something as perfect as, as this, yes, it in fact, will always tell you one, one, one. Um, it, but you could have just as easily, if the first time you asked it, it told you two, because you a third of the time you will find that it's two, then it would continue to tell you, oh yeah, the answer is two. Yes, two. Yes, two. So by measuring on it, I've actually forced it yes. into a particular state. So that is the um, what is what is effectively called the collapse rule. The idea is that whenever I measure something in quantum mechanics, I force it down to one of the possible I force whatever whatever state the system is in, I force it to be in one of the eigenstates. 
and I force it to be in one of the eigenstates that's, that is associated with the energy or the, the result of the measurement that I made, right? Um, there, are, there are some measurements that you can make where multiple eigenstates will map to that result. But in general, let's just say that, you know, you get a one-to-one -one correspondence. So one value you get, you know, you've, you're in this particular state. Um, so I could have any combination of the states that I wanted before, but the moment that I measure it, I'm forced into one. And how I'm forced into one is that I, is, uh, I will see only one of those possibilities, one of those eigenvalues, and it is a probability of which one I will pick. There's no deterministic way, according to quantum mechanics, according to this rule, of knowing whether I will get one, two, or three beyond knowing that with how I've set it up, there's a third chance of getting one, a third of a chance of getting two, and a third chance of getting three. There's no way to predict which one you will get until you get, and, and until you ask it, and it returns a response. Okay. If, let me uh, ask you this then. Um, let's move it to, to something else. Like, let's say we got this light that's looking right at me. Mm -hmm. All right. I know there's photons coming at me, and as we talked about last time, that they can be polarized. They, they, they might have a waveform that's moving like this. They might have a waveform that's moving like this. Right. Okay, so let's say I have two polarization filters. I have one that can check in this orientation and one that can check in this horizontal and vertical. Yep. So I go ahead and I measure. Now, I've, let's say I've got a 50-50 probability mm -hmm. that it's going to be vertical and 50-50 probability that's horizontal. You're saying that I can't know in advance what the probability or whether I'm going to actually get horizontal or vertical, even if the probability was like 99% and 1%, I still can't know for sure that it's always going to come up here. Right. Okay. Right. You, you, if there's, if there's any doubt, you, you can't send out a photon that has, um, that, yeah, you can't know, let's, let's see. The way that you would do, you would do this is like you you are blasting out, you you're blasting out light and you have one polarization like you know you send out photons and there's one that lets through horizontal uh, or vertically oriented photons and one that lets out vertically or horizontally oriented pho polarized photons. What you can't do is say whenever I send out a photon, I know exactly whether it'll come out this one or this one. You will know it will come it will pass through one of them. But you can't know beforehand which one it will pass through, just that it will pass through one of them. Does that make sense? Okay. So even though if I, let's say I know I'm emitting horizontally polarized photons from that light, you're saying, well, it still might come through the vertical and it'll just, I won't measure anything in the vertical. Uh, in this case, no. If I, if I polarized, um, If you have it perfectly polarized for horizontal, then you can say yes. But you've but but by making it perfectly polarized, I've changed my previous thing. You've that I already said. collapsed right. it. You forced it into being this way. I see. But if you have, let's say you've polarized it so it's forty five degrees. Right. Right. A mixture of horizontal and vertical by even amounts, effectively. Well, then you wouldn't be able to say, oh, it will come through this way or it will come through that way. If you have polarized it. 99% horizontal, but or vertical, but 1% horizontal, then you're right. In that state, there's, there's some uncertainty of whether it will come through or not, even though you have a really strong reason for it to show. Like you, you know that it mostly will come through, but there's no guarantee that, you, that if this source sends out a photon, that you'll get a photon on the other side. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Uh, which makes, you know limitations on how well you can guarantee whether these photons are oriented this way. That makes it fun for experimenters. Now, what I've done now, and, and this is kind of what sets quantum mechanics apart from the, the rest of science that we've had, right, is that I've told you that... Um, I told you in postulate... Oh, actually, move your infinite well up. Okay, somebody didn't see it before. There we go. Yeah. 
So what I've told you is that, you know, postulate two tells me that the theory follows the Schrodinger equation, H on state, is determined, but how the state evolves in time is determined by the Hamiltonian of the system. But then I've said, whenever I make a measurement, whenever I make a measurement, there is a stochastic or random, let's just use the colloquial word here, random instant or non, let's say non-continuous. process by which that measurement is made. So that presents a bit of trouble because what I've said is that left to its own devices, the theory follows the normal deterministic continuous processes that everything, every other science that we've done really follows. It's it's got those are very nice properties: determinism and um, continuous behavior. Right, they really go hand in hand. So that the moment that I say, "Oh, okay, these are the these are you know your initial conditions," then you can tell me, "Oh, well, then you know if I look in five seconds, this is what will happen." That's the nice bit about determinism. But postulate seven says, "Hey, whenever I look." Right. Let the time, let the thing evolve. Whenever I look, the result I get is going to be random, and the way that it collapses to that random result, because you know it has to be random, uh, I can't tell you. I can't predict. Right. It's and it and it happens fast, and I lose all the information about all the other stuff. So it's so it's not continuous. It doesn't uh, you know, nicely move to that result. It gives you no. Here's your result. It's a very sharp thing. Um, so are we getting into free will? Or and not free will yet. Potentially, uh, I mean, we kind of got into that with Bell's theorem. You had to ass you had to assume that it wasn't super deterministic. That uh, you know, the experimenters had the choice independent of the universe itself about whether they measured this way or that way. We'll get into that here. Um. So, this is this is in essence the formalism of the measurement problem, right? And in particular. Right. Uh, what postulate seven says is that there's something special about taking a measurement on a system, right, that is different than just how a quantum mechanical system it evolves on its own. But then quantum mechanics doesn't give you a hard line on where what the difference between uh, between a two systems. Right, because obviously just describing single particles isn't useful enough. So, you know, you gotta build the theory up to describe three and four and five. And you know, even with those small particles, the, the theory still works, but there's nothing in the theory that tells you where that stops. So where what stops? Where where quantum mechanics breaks down is I keep adding more and more particles that it has to describe. So, you know, a measurement apparatus, a measuring tape, we we theorize and basically no is uh, going to be made of a bunch of atoms, a bunch of quantum mechanical systems, uh, quantum mechanical part particles. So when I take that and I put it next to a quantum mechanical system, there's nothing in the theory that tells me that maybe those things just don't end up evolving according to quantum mechanics together in the same way that entangled particles do. Um, okay, so you're saying that the measuring tape, you're not sure whether it's going to evolve quantum mechanically as well once you use it to actually measure according to the th according to the mathematical theory there's no reason why uh the apparatus that you're using to measure something and the system that you're measuring can't be considered as its own new system that quantum mechanics would apply to and then f you know be continuous and uh deterministic in the way that it evolves and be something that then i have to take another measurement on top of to make sure that the measurement that it's making is there right uh, this silliness, as as it was sometimes put, uh, was first really kind of described by Schrodinger, 
a guy who we talked about whose equation the quantum mechanics uh, follow. Um, in particular, the very famous uh, Schrodinger's cat that I think everyone has heard into, where you know you put a cat into a box, and uh, in that box is a poison capsule that will release based on whether this uh, this particular atom decays or not. Right? It's a quantum mechanical system, and w as far as the mathematics of it goes regardless of whatever the cat uh, regardless of what happens right i can't tell without looking into the box to know whether the cat has lived or died because i have to make a measurement on the quantum mechanical system that atom that's waiting to decay i have to measure it before it is forced into one of those states so as he pointed out as far as we're concerned the cat is both alive and dead at the same time because as far as we can tell why not? Now, is this just a play on words, right? We're, we're saying the cat is both alive and dead because we're saying there's a probability the cat is alive. Mm -hmm. There's a probability the cat is dead. We haven't performed a measurement yet. Therefore, it actually exists in this quasi-state of both. But once we measure, then there's no longer a quasi-state. Right. So this was uh, kind of what local hidden variables was trying to address because there that's a that's a fuzziness, right? If if the cat is in this mystical state between living and dead, right? Why why can't the cat just see itself and know whether it's alive or dead, right? Um, but as far as the formal workings, as far as our predictive power from quantum mechanics goes, yeah, you can't tell the difference. You don't know whether it's alive or dead, whether even though you know. It should be obvious based on, I guess, the sounds the cat makes or not, <laughs> whether it is alive or dead. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to actually open the box and perform the measurement. And you will be forced into either having the cat being alive or having the cat being dead. And before that, you can't say anything about whether you know, it was dead for so long or not. Um, you can't make any statement about how long it took the poison, how long it took the poison to be activated, how long it took for the, that atom to decay. You have no power as far as as far as the theory of quantum mechanics, the thing that we would use to predict you know, whether something happens or not. The right, the the whole point of of a good theory is to predict what will happen if I in the future, based on some previous set of data that I've took. You know, I put a cat in a box with a poison pill. I hope I know what, I hope I can figure out what's going to happen because poor cat, right? Right. And instead, the best that quantum mechanics can provide is like, uh, look, find out. <laughs> right. Um, but that kind of, we, we, we ran into it because who says that the cat doesn't count as its own observer? Shouldn't the cat be able to determine whether the atom split or not? And why are we forced into um, picking only one? What happens to all the other results? Uh, and this is kind of elaborated on in the fancy example of Wigner's friend. So the idea... So the, the issue here being is, is, is the cat an observer? Does the cat... Is the cat being a large, obviously macroscopic thing, a, a, a creature that can, you know, in a rudimentary way, perform measurements because it can look at its food bowl and go, yes, there's food in there, or no, I need to go yell at my owner until there's food in there, right? Something that, that can look at the physical world and report back about it. In theory, why is that not good enough just because it's in a box to collapse the wave function and tell us what happens? Um, that's actually... Exactly the, the idea of Wigner's friend, because we scale it up to uh, an observable, the, the thought experiment scales it up to an observable creature. So, Wigner's friend. Boom, boom, boom. Right. Oh, you got it. I'm just going to scale that up and hope mostly that's flat. Perfect. All right. So Wigner's friend is a thought experiment that most stably says you've got some quantum mechanical system here uh, that is sending... Expand it a little bit more. Yeah, that's a good idea. Right. Like, can I get Let's... some more water? Thank you. 
let's say it's a photon source in, in this particular implementation, it's a photon source. And basically you've got a system that's sending out single photons that are either horizontally or vertically oriented. And, and in this particular instance, they are set up uh, to be in equal measure. So using the terminology that we learned earlier, we've got two eigenstates represented here, hmm? H yep. and V. Correct. Okay. Two eigenstates. And then if I were to perform the measurement, uh, what's the likelihood of getting the... Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and so so actually, yeah. Uh, this, this photon source uh, is sent to a guy in a lab. We'll call him Vigner's friend. Um, and he's able to make a measurement on it, right? He can record whether the photon is in the horizontal position or the vertical position. So he just says, okay, uh, something equivalent to a Stern-Gerlach, right? It would, a Stern-Gerlach would give you up or down. This will give you horizontal or vertical. Uh, actually, right, the way that we could do that is exactly what we described before. You could just stick a horizontal polarizer on it, and only horizontal uh, photons would make it through. So if he has something that tells him, oh, photons come, what do you see? Well, if he sees a photon, he knows it's horizontally oriented. And if he doesn't see a photon, even though he knows a photon should be there, then he knows it's vertically oriented, right? Uh, and we can do, like, mathematically, we can do this by saying, okay, what's the likelihood if this is our psi, right? I can ask, what is the likelihood that... You know, I'll find it in I'll find it in the horizontal orientation. Well, uh, uh, another thing about how these these guys will interact is that the H will interact with this guy and give you a one, but here, well, you know, I can just draw it out. That's not so bad. Um, I have one squared root two H H plus H, V, close parentheses. This gives me one, and since these differ, that gives me zero. That's an important point. Um, so what, then, what are these two equal signs? Is that, is that apply to the thing on the left? That the... applies to here. Okay. So gotcha. this, yeah, this is the new line, and then these guys apply to here. So basically, that tells me that. Right. If I want to know the probability of getting the result H horizontally oriented, I take this number and basically square it, which will give me a one half. So as far as this concerned, I have a one half probability of getting the horizontal core configuration. And if I were to do this again for V, then I would also find that that's one half. Right. Um, uh, and then this Vigner's friend is in a laboratory, but that laboratory is entirely isolated. Um, and Vigner, our boy here, comes out and says, okay, I'm going to measure the result of this together. I'm going to see if I can get, see quantum mechanically what I can uh, predict whether my friend, what my friend will see. Now, because Wigner doesn't have direct access, it's in a box, what he'll measure inevitably is that, oh, let's take this one here, right, is that Wigner's friend basis, right? So the friend's orientation of, let's say, half. H of V will give us, in Wigner's view, because uh, since he does not have the information of the specific state, what he does know is that if he were to look, right, and see that the, if he were to make his measurement and say uh, on the photon and say, okay, it's in the horizontal position, then his friend's display would also say, oh yes, the photon is H, right? The photon is horizontal. And if he were to 
see, measure it in the vertical, then okay, well, we're both measuring the same thing. So my friend would obviously, his, his, his reported data, his fact, would say, hey, I'm also measuring V. Right? So what this will look like is that the, the state of the system and his friend basically will become entangled together. Right. You can't have the the result of one is specific on the results of the other. So assuming neither is lying and neither's instruments are broken, they're always going to get the same measurement mm -hmm. for the polarization. Right. Now, does this matter which order they measure in? Uh, it will not, actually. Okay. But from what we just learned, if Wigner does it first, he's going to basically force it in to a particular state. So if Wigner opens the lab, so here, here's here's the the fun piece. So the friend can make the measurement at any point, right? Uh, which you know, in theory should collapse the wave function randomly, getting either H or V, horizontal or vertical. And collapse the system, and they'll record it and make it a fact, uh, and record it down and say, "Okay, this is the fact that I observed." Now, what Wigner can do with the information he has is he can perform uh, basically an interference experiment. He can measure together the friend and the photon. He can't get to any one, either one individually because they're both in the lab together, right? The result of the photon and what his friend would say are together isolated from what Wigner can see. And uh, if he, by, by performing an interference experiment, he can, he can test this and see, and what he'll see is that the system is still in a superposition of the two possible states. It's still in a position of, oh, I've got a horizontal result or I've got a vertical result. And what's interesting is you can factor out Right, because if you, if you kind of look at this this wave function, right, no matter what result Wigner finds, he'll find that his uh, friend did have a definite result. So, in fact, you can out from the system have a method that his that Wigner's friend can say, "Yes, I've gotten a definitive measure." Right, I've I've made my measurement. Check the interference, and what will happen is that. Uh, regardless of whether the friend has uh, put out the made the measurement or not is that the there will still be a superposition of the system and his friend between the two possible states of it the photon i got was horizontal or the photon i got was vertical now okay so just so i'm understanding this correctly so we have an experiment mm -hmm. the friend is performing this experiment and right now this is a closed system mm -hmm. Wigner can't actually go in there or he's not going to go in there and mess with anything. So, okay. But Wigner does have this capability to know whether the friend's experiment has actually been performed yet or not. The, the Vig, uh, yeah, you can have, you can give Wigner the ability to know whether the friend has performed the experiment or not. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And in this case, even if the friend has performed the experiment, Wigner is still going to measure I don't know whether he's performed the experiment or not. Effectively. What he will what he will perform is that there's still a superposition between up or down. And um right, what we said with postulate seven is whenever I make a measurement, right, in order for this measurement to actually have happened, I, I basically postulate seven says that a wave function collapse and a measurement are synonymous terms. That's what it tries to say, is that if I have collapsed the wave function, then my quantum mechanical system has been measured somehow. And if I make a measurement, then I sure as heck better find a collapsed wave function. So if I say, okay, I don't see a collapsed wave function, then I can say, okay, no measurement has been taken on the system. But then that leads to a, a contradiction. Because the friend has made a measurement inside their system, and it can even report that they've made that measurement, and collapsed their wave function. 
right? Collapse the wave function that they see that they see for the system, and therefore collapse should collapse their own wave function into the yes, photon is in H or photon is in V, right? It should it should force them into one or the other, but Figner will still measure that there's a superposition between the two. So is Figner's observations flawed then? Is he just not using the right method to determine whether the friend has actually collapsed the wave function or not? No, uh, because if Vigner, I mean, if Vigner directly opens the, the box, walks into the lab and looks at it, that'll collapse the wave function. But when he asks, even if the measurement has been done, if he asks, has a measurement been completed? Because if a measurement is completed, then it should collapse all, all parts of the quantum mechanical system, right? So... So the say so the in order to, for Wigner to be able to say that a measurement has occurred, he should see a collapse. He should see a collapse of the wave function down to a single result because the friend has forced the quantum mechanical system down into a single result. But when he asks, okay, is it still entangled regardless of whether there has been reported a mess a, a measurement or not he will always see that it is in a superposition and has to conclude that no measurement has been made even while the friend is saying yes i've made a measurement because as far as quantum mechanically he has the information access to he can't you know determine that without opening the box itself even though the quantum mechanics right even though the 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 quantum part should be gone from that system Okay, so in this, let, let's let's go into a little more detail on this. Okay, so obviously we're not actually talking about macroscopic friends, correct? Because clearly if I, let's say I'm in the box with a cat, mm -hmm. and I can tell you, 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 you radio me and say, hey Rob, is the cat dead? And I say, no. Then the cat is definitely not dead at that point, correct? I've collapsed the wave function as far as we're concerned up to that time. So that would be the the equivalent of me peeking into the system and looking at your result. Okay. Right. So that's breaking the quantum mechanics from Wigner's perspective. Right. So this is where we get into. Wait a minute. These two people have measurements that depend on their perspective, and the hope is. Right. The hope was is that, you know, if quantum mechanics has forced us into a result that we could agree upon uh, the results that are observed. Right. That that. To use a, a phrase from Bong, that there is an absoluteness of observed events. If an event has been observed by one observer, then it should be observed by another. OK, but you you're not actually saying that. We don't have a radio in this experiment. I, I'm not actually messaging you and telling you, hey, the cat's alive or the cat's dead. You're saying that there is some special ability you have as Vigner that can determine whether I would be able to tell you over a radio whether the cat is alive or dead. But I have not actually, we've not actually performed that communication. So, yeah, because if you were to do that communication, that, that would effectively break that would be the same as like i said that would be the same as a measurement on the system if if you had a button that you could press once you did the experiment but didn't tell you anything about the result of the experiment then as far as vigner's quantum mechanics is able to tell you right it still could vigner's quantum mechanics from his perspective couldn't say what result you had so you would still be in a superposition so if you ask okay are you in a superposition he'll get yeah they're in a superposition okay right so there's no collapse from his perspective which means he should say no what are you doing you haven't made a measurement you haven't caused collapse okay so does that make sense yeah so are we getting into a play of words here and, and is it too early for me to ask you this question because basically we've, we've created this experiment I'm in there, I'm measuring the polarization of the photon, and I press a button when I've completed the experiment. Mm -hmm. Now, you are able to do some type of special operation where you can determine that the, whether the waveform has collapsed. You can't tell what state it's in. You can't determine anything else, but all you can say is, is, okay, from my point of view, you have 
actually not performed the measurement yet. Even though you're telling me with this button that you performed the measurement, yep. you are saying as Wigner, I, I, I'm not observing that you've done this. So if that's what's going on, or do we just have a difference in terms? Because you've, you basically haven't been able to perform the box opening procedure that I would have done. So are we just kind of playing with words here, or is there some type of physics implication here that is actually opened up by this? So in the same way that EPR kind of were asking for a theory that through hidden information could be that 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 could look for a theory that was more sharp less fuzzy than quantum mechanics right here we're asking for is there a theory out there that can describe that can reconcile how to describe these two different situations right and have it so that yeah Wigner that 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 there is something Wigner could do aside from directly opening the box to know whether, or to, to, to jointly describe that um, his truth about whether it's entangled is true and that the um, friend's point of view. When I'm pressing the button, it's, right. it's also. Right. Okay. Right. Is there some theory that can reconcile these two? Uh, the, the, the truth values of whether, you know, whether I pick to, whether Wigner picks to open the box or whether he picks to measure the interference that can properly describe what's going on and say, oh, okay, once the friend's measured this, then I know that the friend has measured it, that, that quantum mechanics, that there's some evidence in, you know, either a breakdown or something, aside from literally doing the thing that causes on my end quantum mechanics to break down, which is to look into the thing, look into the box. Is there something else you can do that, that jointly describes this probability? And so the way to test this, actually, because um, just... Wigner's friend uh, thought experiment on its own uh, isn't enough to lead to um, anything that you can resolve because uh, anything that you can definitively resolve. Um, you it can... sounds ambiguous to me so far. Like we, we, we're just missing a piece of information, kind of the same point of view Einstein had. Yeah. Um, and that's like been the whole point, right? Of the whole embattlement of quantum mechanics is like, okay, it just. It feels like there's just just this little extra bit that if we just had, we could make this so much nicer and so much like all the other theories that we've come up with. Um, so the way to test this is actually you end up doubling your your scenario. You end up does it not come with it? Is uh, is yeah. oh I didn't make a picture for that. I don't think that's fine. Um, is to have a single source of photons that you send into a lab with a friend and then have, look at my stick man drawing. And then in addition to that, actually let's just go ahead and center this, have uh, another particle that's entangled to the one that we sent over here basically double up our experiment so that we have, let's call uh, two, two, we have two Wigner friend, Wigner's friends experiments set up together, basically. Um, and the way we're going to do this is we are going to have a, let's get these guys, uh, a single source of entangled particles. Uh, here we're going to use photons. And they're going to be sent to labs that are monitored by Alice and Bob. And in those labs are going to be people who can directly measure, um, are going to be this is Debbie, look at that bad handwriting, and Charlie. So, Debbie and Charlie will play the role of the two Wigner's friend, and Alice and Bob will be uh, Wigner's themselves. Right? Uh, Charlie and Debbie have the ability to measure the state of the system that pops out, whether it is you know horizontally or vertically oriented. Um, and then Alice and Bob can choose to do one of two things. They can open the box 
and verify the friend's measurement, right? They can say, hey, Charlie, what did you get? And then Charlie can either message the message on the radio or they can look at the results of the dial and tell them, hey, this is what I got. Or Alice and Bob can do that interference. They can check, okay, are Charlie, it, it, you know, is Charlie and the system still entangled? Or Bob can ask, are Debbie and the system still entangled? So they can do those two uh, different things. We'll call that, uh, yeah. So Alice can do A1, just look at C's results, right? At Charlie's results, or she can do an interference experiment and check according to from her quantum from her perspective whether a measurement has occurred or not. Uh, same for Bob. Right, Bob, this is we'll call it B0 to say that Bob looks at Debbie's results, or Bob B1 for performs. So uh, both neither A1 nor B1 will actually collapse the waveform. Right. But obviously A0 and B0 are going to collapse it. Right. So pull those guys up a little bit. Yeah. Um, what the... Thanks. This is what I get for not actually looking at the screen. <laughs> yeah. So the the hope is, right, we, we described a situation where, you know, the people inside and outside of the system, depending on their perspective, they agreed whether a result happened or not. The question is, can I come to a result or can I come up with a theory? It does, maybe not quantum mechanical or not. Uh, can I come up with some better, more inclusive theory that allows us to resolve this, that allows us to um, figure out these things um, and jointly describe the truths of all of these possible measurements. Now, if you remember the last talk, right, I had a, a similar setup where we had an entangled machine sending out particles that were entangled to two different observers who could make measurements on them, mm -hmm. right? This was the basis of Bell's thought experiment that eventually we were able to do and show, hey, eh, maybe locality is a little oof, right? Um, and in fact, now that we've set this up, what we have done is set up the setting for a Bell's experiment. We can look at Bell's states. And so I can set up a theorem that follows the way that we proved Bell's theorem, right? That followed the way that we showed, hey, locality and hidden local hidden variable theories, uh, maybe they're not on the table. If we're going to trust that quantum mechanics correctly predicts things and has to be, at least according to the empirical evidence, more correct. Right? So, uh, this comes from a paper by, I believe I'm spelling this right, Bruckner in 2000 and... 19, I believe. So this is pretty recent. Yes. So this is, uh, again, that first paper that I showed you. Um, that first paper that I showed you was in 2018. So all of this is in response to that, all within the last two years. This is very fresh science. It's real cool. Um, so what we'll call, this is a no-go theorem for... Server independent facts. Okay. Uh, specifically, I, I kind of already get the implication here from this. Yeah. Following are incompatible. And what we'll list are basically four things that we would like for physical theories to have. First off, 
what we know from quantum theory, right, is that it's universally valid. So it works at all times and all places? Not just all times and all places, but all, and more importantly, at all scales. Mm. So technically, if I knew all quantum mechanics and I knew how to measure, right, like a, an initial state of your body and each particle, if I had the wave function that described all of you, I could use quantum mechanics to predict, you know, how you would behave and should be able to come up with the possibilities of whether you, you know, a... I guess according to quantum mechanics, I should be able to predict uh, what's the likelihood that you end up working out in the gym or whether you go up to get a sandwich or whether you go out to, you know. Whether I'm sitting in the core of Jupiter right work. now. Exactly. Right. Right. Where you are, what you're going to do, that kind of thing. Now, you know, fortunately, we don't have big enough computers to do that quite yet. But in theory, the, because quantum quantum mechanics, as the way that we postulate it, has no limit on where that in between, you know, observer and system is, it should apply to anything you know, the, uh, on any scale, no matter how many quantum particles we put together. To be clear, though, it, it doesn't yet. Yeah, actually, we don't have a quantum theory that actually has this. For instance, the black hole singularities. I mean, yeah, but that's be that that breaks down all of our theories. Right, and that makes yeah, <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. To be clear, yes, we do know that there is lots wrong with our current theories. We know, and, and that's actually, we know that the interface between general relativity, between our theory for big scale and our theory for small scale, breaks down, and there are corner cases, and we don't know how those match up, and one of the best is black holes, right? Because uh, largely, I can almost treat them quantum mechanically. They are specified by a few by a small set of quantum numbers, and if I replace, you know, the the black hole that's at the center of our universe versus, I don't know, maybe the one that's unknowingly hurtling towards us. Galaxy. Uh, oh, did I say solar system? You said universe. Ah. <laughs> uh, you know what? I've spent all this time talking about <laughs> that's a no with no. relativity and preferred no Doug preferred would have reference our heads. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I never had to deal with his ire. <laughs> I, I'm sure he will make a lovely YouTube comedy. No. no. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, next, because this is a Bell uh, setup, what we are going to ask is that is a local theory, that locality is in fact um, observed, right? Basically, we said, hey, things that are outside of light cones don't affect something, something that's inside a particular light cone, right? I can't, if light could, if, if light couldn't reach me from an event, then that event can't affect how I, you know, choose to move on. Uh, three. Spooky action at a distance. Yeah. Yep. Um, because it turns out that we, you know, really hold on to uh, our ability to describe things locally. Uh, three, I'm going to assume that freedom of choice on what I choose to measure. Um, right. Whether whether I whether Alice or Bob chooses to look in or chooses to do an interference is a free parameter effectively that you know based on some previous set i couldn't predict for you oh okay i know that bob is going to first look and then not look and then not look and then look right um yeah that that uh, that i couldn't know that beyond you know asking bob right i couldn't predict look at how bob was uh eating breakfast that morning and go, aha, that's exactly So are you, are you saying that you can't, there's no determinism in the observer's choice to observe? Uh, effectively, no super determinism, right? Oh, so this is kind of a meta thing. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, free will. <laughs> right. The, the, the experimenters are free to choose whatever measurement they want to make, and they're that measurement they choose to make is not determined by something previous in their you know, histories. Right. Or if it is, you can only assign a probability. You can't assign, assign a definite. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe we could come up with some theory of like, oh, okay, 
Alice had a lovely childhood and is definitely more likely to go with the A option, but Bob's bad childhood makes him going to go with, <laughs> right. you know, the direct one. Um, and then indep observer independent facts, right? An observer independent facts, right? Because uh, what we're going to call a fact here is something about, um, well, a, a measurement that is made and the result of that measurement, right? So, for example, back to Wigner's friend, we had Wigner's friend having the fact that the photon, let's say, is an H. But Wigner would say it's a fact that no measurement has been performed because the superposition hasn't been collapsed. Those two things don't mesh with each other. And they are, and so the facts of what, this, what the system has done are not observer dependent according to that thought experiment. So for our theory, we want to say, ah, we want to have observer independent facts. We want to have it so that. And to be clear, this has already been experimentally verified. So we're we're going to get to actually how okay. they do this. I'm just uh, setting up the theory first. Okay. And then we're going to talk about the experiment because that's fun. And then there's implications because of how they had to actually uh, implement it. So similar to how um, you know Bell kind of used three um, statements here we've got four um, but together these things would kind of imply uh, kind of these directly imply that I could come up with some probability function that tells me the likelihood of the result of a0 a1 b0 and b1 all together Right. So that I could have some master function that, that there exists, maybe only, the, maybe only the universe or God knows it, but there exists some probability function that describes you, uh, the truth values associated with each of these four um, quantities. Now, aren't two of these highly correlated, though? Isn't B1 and, or excuse me, B0 and A0 correlated? Because we're dealing with an entangled particle. Right. So... It will potentially be correlated between the A and the B, but because of your choice between choosing B0 and B1, we are in a different space than just the um, Bell theorem, Bell statement. But yeah, uh, yeah. so quantum mechanics will tell us that they are going to end up being a bit correlated, and the, the way that those correlations work are beyond what any theory with local hidden variables can describe. And here, we're going to find that quantum mechanically, we can't reproduce using a theory that matches these uh, conditions, these, oh, wouldn't it be nice if, or actually even more, I think the universe works this way. If a theory can match what, what we think the universe should do, uh, it won't give us quantum mechanical probabilities. And we know, and we can verify that the quantum mechanical uh, probabilities are the ones that we see is the problem okay so you're saying that we can't have all four of those at the same time correct and any theory that describes the reality that we are actually able to observe correct if quantum mechanics is correct which uh empirically it appears to be then one of those four things is incorrect one of those four things has to be given up now is it possible one is incorrect sometimes and another one is incorrect another time I suppose in theory, yes. Although one would want a theory that is consistent with how, uh, with with what postulate statements you could say about it, or, hmm, I suppose one could come up with a theory that that describes in a meta context which postulates apply to it. But then you're getting really into the realm of hard to verify. <laughs> um, because that would basically be describing an experiment that. Would would have one outcome sometimes and one right. outcome another time. So the the beyond anything else, when you're dealing with physics, the fundamental thing that we have to pray is true, is that physics is the same no matter where or how you perform it. So if I have a a system that you know follows these postulates sometimes, but in ten minute, but every other third minute, one of them changes out for this fourth one then uh, I'm kind of screwed because there's no way, even, even if I have these assumptions, it's hard enough to verify uh, whether the assumptions that I'm bringing to the table 
actually can map reality, actually can match reality or not, right? This took oof, 30, for this one, this took uh, 100 years from when Wigner first about, from when Wigner first thought about the experiment, right? To even get close to verifying whether, you know, that thought experiment made sense or not. Uh, with Bell's theorem, right? That took, uh, it took, what, seven, almost 70 years from when Einstein first realized, oh, this thing is scary, to think of, well, here's an experiment, a theoretical experiment that could potentially verify whether it's, you know, whether this this weird fuzziness is true or not. And then it took until four years ago, mm -hmm. right, five years ago, to finally get one to get an experiment that with reasonable, uh, right, with all that, that could be fully said is it's reasonable that we don't have any potential loopholes getting around. And therefore we've proven that, yeah, this fuzziness is here. Was this, was that the experiment where we were using starlight? No, that was, that was, uh, an experiment. Oh, oh, oh okay. So actually a reproducible experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 20. Cause I think there was another experiment that came out a few years ago that also oh. confirmed the inequality. Yeah. Um, cause well, it was, it was a different part of it. Cause we, we knew that they couldn't be correlated cause they were, they were too far away. Yeah. 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 Cause you had the, you had, oh yeah. That was, yeah. I don't remember if that was proving okay. uh, entanglement. No, this was, this was one that was, I believe still done physically more than just looking at the, the entanglement of the stars. It was an active experiment, not passive. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So the four statements they said would assume would would make us think that okay we can have uh, some master probability equation that describes the truth values of these four different experiments all together, and what I would want is to be able to have what we'll call the marginals right. I would want um, to be able to say the probability of say for example a zero be one, right, by just taking this master equation and summing out, right, the two that I don't use. Right, by summing over the, the two that I, the two results that I'm not interested in, I will get a slice of the probability that tells me, oh, okay, the probability that Alice, you know, the result of Alice looking at the thing and the result of Bob measuring the interference. Right, that's what a, what this marginal is going to be. Um, and so the hope is that we can construct this guy so that it matches, we can observe the these guys so that you can, so that when I sum it, you know, it'll reduce down to these marginals. Um, and once I've, once I've set that up, if, Granted, this is uh, it was it was complicated. If I set that up, then the average quantities, because it's a Bell experiment, you know, I can talk about a the average quantities of a zero uh, b one or a zero b zero, or right. I can talk about the average of any pair of a x or y, where x and y can be zero or one then I know since this is a Bell system, it must match those, uh, the, the Clauser, Horn, Schumann, and Hall inequality I had before, right? Which was that fancy function, if you remember it's S, which in the language that we have here, we can say that it must be that according to, um, what's it, according to, oh, excuse me, I don't want a comma there. These two things are multiplied together. So A, the result of whatever Alice does times the result of whatever Bob does. We can look at the average probability, the average quantity of that. And there we go. This, just like how with in doing Bell's theorem, we came up with a function, came up with some combination of average quantities that said, okay, I can I can say if I have all of the things that Bell's theorem wants to prove all of you know all the things that Einstein wants in his local hidden variables, then this quantity has to be less than a certain number, and oh look if I, I can f I can find a quantum mechanical system that breaks that, which means 
your system can't have all quantum mechanics can't have those nice properties. Right. Okay. So unpack that a little bit because it seems like you've gotten to the crux of the solution here. Mm -hmm. So here that special function ends up being, it looks like this. And this has to be less than or equal to two. So basically, this this s. So for any given a one b one a zero b zero. Okay. So for right the the results of whether you know I I look at the uh, Alice looks at the spin interference or looks at the actual result. Yeah. Um. Or whether Alice, whether Alice and the 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 average results that they'll get if Alice and Bob both don't look and perform interference, or Alice looks and Bob do, and Bob doesn't, or Bob looks and Alice doesn't, um, and it turns out minus the uh, result of if Alice and Bob both look, any theory that I can come up with that has these four properties. Right, that quantum mechanics is universally valid no matter the scale, because according to our theory it should be, that things are locally um, dependent, there's, there's no spooky action at a distance, that you have free will, it's not super deterministically chosen, and that you have what are called observer-independent facts, so that the observers don't have this mismatch of whether they think an, an experiment or a, a measurement has been performed or not, Right. If I want a theory that has those nice four things, then it has to be that this function that I've just come up with, which um, Bell came up with when he was formulating this, it doesn't necessarily, I believe, it doesn't necessarily directly correlate to anything um, physically. This might, given an S, it might be interesting, but no one, when they're writing about it, says that it has to directly correlate to a physical quantity. It's just, it's the result of things that we can measure. Um, yeah, that's a point beyond what really matters. It, so this is, this is, this is a, a particular combination of things that we can measure. And I know that this particular combination is limited to the value two, if it is going to have those four properties, those things that we hope reality does. And then what happens, um, Okay, so it might be uh, beyond an intuitive leap how you get from those four things to this actual number two. Is there a quick way to... We did this in part one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so that would be the best way for somebody to understand how we actually got this number yes, two. absolutely. When we're applying those four things. So, so the, the fact that we've doubled the Vigner's friend experiment was exactly so that we could use this particular function and the math that lets us say it has to be capped at two because otherwise you have to come up with, you know, you, you would have to come up with some other set of functions. We don't, basically, Bell was very smart and realized how to place a cap on something you could say based on assumptions you made, you know, and the experiments that he came up with. And using cosines right. so, so that he would, he would know that it would have to sum up in some circumstances right. beyond that number, right? And, um, yeah, if there's, if there's, Anything that physicists do, it's look to what works and try to shoehorn anything new into that shape, <laughs> right? Uh, the world is filled with harmonic oscillators. Oh, yeah. You know, because they work or maybe we're just not imaginative to find anything else, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, so, so this kind of work plays the same role as, as you know, harmonic oscillators in any new theory that you're exploring. You're just kind of like, oh... Well, I know how to do this one thing, and I kind of know how to do it all right, so let me manipulate my system so that it matches this one thing. That's why we've doubled up on our um, that's why we've doubled up on our on our Vigner's friend experiment so that we could have a bell experiment okay. kind of boiled into it. And so with that, we ask, okay, um, are is there a system? 
that I can come up with that breaks this? And the answer is, in fact, yes. So, this comes from um, the uh, Proietti et al. in 2000. If it actually ranks in front of me, I think this is 2020. Like very new stuff. This is 2019, excuse me. It's extremely cutting edge. Oh, yes. This is also why it's hard to put these things together because no one has uh, thought through this and put together a nice summary article. It's, in fact, wow, all that's research. That's what we're doing right now. It's all research papers. It's so good. <laughs> all right, so let's go here. All right, at all, set up this experiment here. Okay, we have um, we we have a, a setup where the role of the friends are going to be played by photons that can make measurements, and yeah, then Bob and Alice will. So, be how does a photon make a measurement? So we'll get through this. So, okay, uh, first up. We have S0. This is our center source of photons. They will be put into a superposition of plus and minus states. Um, I believe the exact one. Yeah. Um, it's the singlet state, so you will have a superposition. Uh, nope. Don't me. So we have coming out. guy it is one over square root two h v minus v h basically um one of the photons will be horizontally uh, polarized and one will be vertically polarized um, so let's go ahead and go follow this along um, to alice's side first so uh the the claim first off is okay how does a photon make a measurement right so first uh the authors make comment formally because we have to define what an observation is and what an observer is so formally an observation is the act of extracting and storing information about an observed system mm. accordingly we define an observer as any physical system that can extract information from another system by means of some interaction and store that information in a physical memory right so if uh alice's friend regardless of whether she's a photon or not can give you access to whether you know the photon coming from the source s1 s0 is um horizontally or vertically oriented then the then that counts as an observer that counts as an observation um, because the information about the information about what state this guy is in has been recorded somewhere Okay, so is this, are you saying the photon is literally an observer of itself? Because you would literally look at that photon to determine no. whether it's no, polarized? No, no, so, so this is going to be the, this uh, is the photon to be measured from. So it's sending out, this guy sends a single photon here. Alice's friend will be played by this set of entangled photons. So this source of entangled photons, it sends out also a pair of photons that will be horizontally or vertically polarized okay so what's going to happen is that these two sources of photons will interact here at a what's called a type one fusion gate and basically um with a success probability of one half it will be able to determine the polarization of the incoming photon so coin flip right um Coin flip for because of how basically this this particular experimental setup like this device works, uh, coin flip on whether it determines what the outcome is. Um, but when it deter if it does, so it's got a fifty percent chance of making a measurement. Right. But it's uh, always going to get the measurement right if it does yes. make the measurement. Okay. So when that measurement happens, right? If if it's able to measure that um, path, actually, I delete. Do I get rid of the picture? Don't. This is beautiful. 
right? If path A, right, photon in path A is ends up being horizontally oriented, right? When um and this guy is able to to see that, then that will break the should break the entanglement um from the fo from the photon coming outside of it that is going to Alice. Because that also has a 50% chance of being horizontally polarized, and then they'll interfere with each other for right. the same polarization. Right. Okay. Right. So these two, if if uh, these guys match, they'll be able to, um, if they match, then they'll both be sent out of this type 1 fusion gate, as it's called. Um, and so uh, a fusion gate will send out, right, from it, these guys come in. Right, there are two inputs from the two entangled sources, and then out from them comes here, which is bounced and sent to this detector. Now, this detector has another um, another device in front of it that basically erases any polarization information about it. This plays the role of that, hey, a measurement has been performed. So it'll make an audible click that can exit the system, but you still don't have any information about uh, what the value of that measurement has. Now, is it an observer? But because the photon basically collides with it. When you get a collision of a photon, then it's saying, hey, I know a, a measurement's made. I'm not telling you what it was, but I do know that yeah. a measurement was made. Uh, I, could, I could count that as an observer because it is physically storing that, hey, a photon came through. This would be the measurement of, you know, did the fusion, did, did the fusion gate work correctly or not, right? Okay. Um... So basically by breaking the entanglement from SA, right, this photon makes a measurement on the, um, on the polarization that came from the photon that came from S0, right? Um, and so then, right, so now we have the friend has the ability to make the measurement. Maybe, you know, maybe it fails and they don't, but you'll hear a click. You can hear the click. Alice can hear the click. Um, when that measurement has happened or not. And then Alice has a choice, right? Alice for, um, for what's it? For A0, uh, she can remove this device here and basically just measure these beam lines here directly, right? Because this apparatus non non destructively measures the photon, right? They'll encounter, they'll entang, they'll see each other and if, yeah, uh, regardless of what the polarization was, if it was going to be able to make it to this measuring device, then it would um, pass through. Does that make sense? Not that very last piece, no. Is it is it kind of like a prism? Is it a waveguide? Yeah. So so it's uh, it's a polarizing beam splitter. Okay. Um, is is the thing that you can use to enact this fusion gate. Basically, you're able to not you're you're able to measure the 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 polarization of the photon and not destroy it. So you don't have to absorb the photon in order to say was it horizontally oriented or was it vertically oriented. Um, now, is, it, is this because the photon smacks into it and re-emits it in the same way, or is it just because the photon happens to fit through if it is matching or hit something? Uh, like, like, how does it actually know that it's horizontal? or Because that, from our previous talk, would basically be an observation of the photon. Once you, once you tell me whether it's horizontal or vertical, then you've made an observation. Yeah, that's the point. And, is you've, made the, you've made the observation, but you can do observations without... Um, making without destroying your quantum mechanical not not without destroying the quantum mechanical piece but without destroying the photon itself right Th this yeah this would be like going through a polarizer right you haven't destroyed the photon once it's gone through the polarizer you've just destroyed its fuzziness right uh okay but obviously and that's why this only works 50 percent of the time because the other time it's just going to smack into the yeah here okay i said this one so this is what a um, polarizing beam uh, splitter will do. If you have two photons coming in that are horizontally oriented, they'll bounce off each other. And so what you can, what you would do is you would put, you know, a to to do what they say a, a type one, let's type one detector, right? I would put a detector here, 
that can measure a single that can measure a single photon and tell you its orientation. So here, this would be a, so if they match, right? In this case, if the orientations of the two photons coming in match, then one goes out one way and the other one goes out the other way. If they're opposite, then the way that it will force it is that both of them will go either one direction or the other. So in the case of, you know, B, right? No photon even reaches the detector, so you can't even tell. You can't even tell, you know, what, anything about the photon. And then if both of the photons do reach the detector, you can't tell which one came from where. Okay, so that's how it gets around it, because it amb ambiguizes which photon it measured. Right. I see. And this can only work because there's two photons, therefore you can have ambiguity. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So that's that's that allows for a non-destructive fit. So you you get you know that right cuz because you know whatever photon you had yeah had to be whatever photon is coming out of this has to be oriented in a particular way. Has to be oriented in a matching way. And then once you right so to get so t basically to look at what is the result of this I would simply and when you say it's not destructive, it's not even unentangling the photons, correct? Their entanglement is still intact after going through the the splitter. Uh, the entanglement of which photons? Well, uh, the ones that came out of S zero. Yeah, the ones that came out of S zero are still entangled with each other, even after coming out of the splitter. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, which is the fun bit because even though right because if you make that measurement and break and break the entanglement, what you're breaking is not the entanglement what you're breaking is the fuzziness that was between which one was oriented this way or that way right right, right. you 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 they they they're still reliant on each other because now that i know that this that the one that went to alice alice's system was horizontally oriented well now i know the one that goes to bob is vertically oriented I do, right? I yeah, see. Yeah, right. Yeah. but but you can break the uh the the quantum position right the quantum superposition between those two indeterminate outcomes okay right um so you know, when I measure this and I see, okay, yeah, uh, let's say Alice is just looking into the box and saying, okay, I'm just going to make sure I don't trust Alice's thing. I'm just going to look at whatever the source was, right? So, you know, if it comes through and it's horizontally oriented, then I know that this had to be horizontally oriented, right? So I can reach in and directly measure what, what, what came out of S1 if I'm Alice. Or if I want to perform that interference that we talked about, I let that beam splitter sit in here. Now, are you making this decision after you hear the click? You can make the decision after you hear the click, as long as you don't as long as you don't have detectors, right? So, as long as you don't have your detectors cr intercepting the beam, right? The moment that you have detectors intercepting the beam, whether you've left this guy here or not, you've chosen to make a measurement. Okay, so the little. Yeah, so these these half ball looking things are your tails. Yep. Are, okay. So I can so if I don't put those anywhere and I just let, you know, have a laser shining wherever, no no measurement has been made, so we can't say anything about or it. Or at least you didn't make it. Right. If if I put them in front and now I've measured it, aha. I've I've made my choice of whether I'm going to put it directly in there or whether I'm going to use um the another partial beam splitter or no, excuse me, not partial. Uh polarizing beam splitter to perform an interference. Right? Now, okay, because I remember you saying that the observer is non-determined, mm -hmm. well, you know, the choice he makes. But obviously, that thing making a click is not going to reach you in time for the photon that's traveling through. And in fact, there's even an electrical signal is not going to travel fast enough. So you would have had to make this choice ahead of the photon being emitted by S0. Correct? Uh, yes, so... So, hmm. two hours. Okay. Wow, man, we've gone through two hours. Oh my goodness! It felt like nothing. <laughs> well, we're oh geez. Can you just check the. Uh... Huh. It's good. What's What's good to know is we're on page four of the nine pages of notes that I have. This is good stuff, man. Now, on the plus side, a lot of this is just pictures that's left. So hopefully, it's not quite as rough. Um, one thirty-three. Oh, okay. Oh, that's plenty of time. Sorry. Yeah. 
yeah. So so in theory, you could have an audible click, or you could have it hooked up to hooked up to a light. For example, they could reach you. Um, although I guess, hmm, individual photon it might might be a loophole. The authors don't address that. Whether that's a a Oops. particular hmm, loophole or not. Um, trying to remember. Right, because there's... There's a there's a, a little bit of ambiguity about, for example, how long a photon is. So you could potentially, um, oof, I'm trying to remember if if this is absolutely correct, uh, but it could be that that said single photon right stretches across the entire distance of this apparatus. Now, right, because there's because there's no set like number of wavelengths that a single photon has to occupy spatially wise right a single photon um could be in the moment of its existence from at least from its perspective uh from its source to its end hmm. yeah let's leave it at the authors didn't address it so now, as far as the theory as far as the theory goes, there's no problem with that. Um, okay, right. So, if you if you were worried about that as a loophole, there's nothing saying that we could construct this with a better system that allowed for more time between when the click happened and when you have to choose which measurement you make. Okay, right. Um, yeah, the fact the fact that it is photons does make that a little suspect. I'll give you that. Um, but as far as what we can predict, right, there's, there's, what do I want to say? There's nothing stopping us from, from being more creative and finding and creating a system that has these entangled particles that move slow enough that you could tell, right? You could hear, you could respond to the, the click from your friend saying, Hey, I've made a me made a measurement. Okay, but we would have to use a particle in, in that case. So uh, that we're, we're subluminal. Possibly. Um, I'm sure I'm sure there's someone out there who can who can argue and, and remember exactly things like, okay, how much the like the length of the photo of a photon would interact with this um, and be able to tell you whether it's appropriate for whether you know this exper experiment does fall. You know, under, uh, whether that is a loophole or not, basically. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll email the authors. Hmm. That's a good point. And then they'll laugh at us. <laughs> like, come on, we addressed this in section A. You know, reading is hard, <laughs> even in <laughs> even in science. <laughs> um. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the way that it, this this then has described the two key components that are important, right? Which is that. We have a source of entangled photons. We have the friend's way of making a measurement, right? And then Alice having the choice between whether to measure directly a zero, putting detectors here and here, or performing an interference matrix and asking, okay, are these things still entangled? Right. Um, and so from that, we can... Well, here, the authors go ahead and physically measure, right? If we remember, we want to, from the system, measure these quantities and ask, well, are they less than or greater than two? So in order in, th in the quantum mechanical theory, um, right, the, uh, an important point, uh, excuse me, when we go over to Bob's system, the only thing that changes is that we have that little polarizer there, mm. um, that uh, I believe it's a half wave plate. Yeah. Um, this does the job of taking whatever photon is sent out and rotating it by seven pi sixteenths. So it's actually changing the polarization of the photon coming in? It it rotates it so that but you can still have the same set of experiments measuring um, 
what's it the the horizontal vertical because uh i don't think we covered this so much in the last episode now when we get to the next episode we'll do it in more detail but the the thing that's interesting is that it's not it's not that when Bob and Alice for the belt for for let's go jump back to Bell's theorem. When Bob and Alice are measuring what you know the entangled particles with their Stern Gerlach machine, it's not that we can't explain right why they get the same results when they have the same orientation, right? We could do that with local hidden variables, right? That can very easily explain why this match. What it can't do is why do we get the the probabilities of the results for you know uh, red green uh, up down for this orientation while at the same time we're getting the probabilities of up down for this orientation so when it's correlated or anti-correlated yeah we can get it but it's the off correlations that really uh, will cause a problem that quantum mechanics has probabilities that are different than the probabilities that would be predicted by your nice theories the ones that match what you kind of hoped reality would be. Okay, so I'll have to take your word on that one. Well, so so it's dealt. Um, we'll potentially get to that. Okay. Okay. Um, so these quantities. What is the average result of Alice and Bob measuring one? You know, both doing interference. The mixture. One of them choosing to do interference, and one of them choosing to look, and then the one where they both choose to look right question is how does that end up well here we're going to get real sciency this is what actual science looks like and boy is it bizarre sometimes it's pretty straightforward um here we go this is the result that they had right the four quantities that we mentioned right we cared about Average of A of A, B, zero, right. A, zero, B, one, right? These four guys. And this is for the four quantities that actually, out of the out of the total of, I think, 16 things that you can measure for the four that actually matter for each possible result. Basically, when you, you know, choose A or B to be, you know, zero or one, you rule out um, the other... 12 results that will always just give you zero. So this is your relevant data. Um, and what we find is we have these quantities, plus or minus some amount of uncertainty. And if I plug that into that S formula that I had, what I end up with is that with that photo, with that, you know, pair of entangled particles, one of them being rotated a particular amount, the S function that I get, I have it here. Uh, S experimental is going to be 2.416 actually let me move it over here so I have some space plus or minus 0 0.075 so what does that mean? well we said okay for our nice theory right S has to be less than or equal to 2, but reality gives me this guy. And even more unfortunate, if you will, is that 0 .7, 0 0.075, uh-oh, this result is away from this result yeah. by more than five standard deviations. And for anyone uh, not familiar with the science uh, community, that is basically meant as, oh yeah, we got this measurement right, there's no error, and uh, there's no way that you can say, oh, well, maybe my instrumentation was off, maybe I didn't measure something. This is far enough away from within, the, the result is, is um, yeah, far enough away that it would be, oh, what is it? The likelihood of getting this result while, in fact, you, if you had a perfect measurement, you would have gotten two. If you had perfect accuracy, you would have gotten two. Is, is it like, what is five sigma again? Is it 99.997 or something like that? Yeah, it's like it's a one in 
ten thousand chance or something. Okay. One in twenty ten thousand hundred thousand? Something big. Yeah. Something it's it is excessively unlikely mm -hmm. that this is a result of anything but the theory being correct and saying no. In fact, we can't reach these things. Okay. Now, so, so yeah. Now, this is our, our experiment result, but what I did kind of say is that we went ahead and talked about how we, we manipulated Wigner's friend experiment, doubled it up so that we could mash it into a... Um, a Bell's locality type argument. And you might look at me and go, well, okay, but we already talked about that. We talked about how locality is already the big boogeyman, and maybe if we get rid of that, it'll get rid of all of our problems. But fortunately, we have uh, the paper that I actually sent you, our latest hero, in the form of Bong et al., coming out in 2020, uh, came in and said, uh, no, in fact, regard this, this is different than, and actually, no, to be fair, um, Bruckner and Proyeri um, talked about this as well, but Bong's paper does it in the most detail, um, said that, no, 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 we can relax these conditions and show that it, it is more than just another proof of Bell's theorem. It's more than just another damnation of locality. All right. So, hmm. because what they do is, while observer independent uh, uh, facts kind of requires people to agree on potentially experiments that haven't, uh, measurements that haven't been performed, the bond comes in and says, okay, we don't need observer independent facts. Instead, what we can relax it is to the absoluteness of observed events, which is that an observed event is a single real event and not relative to anything or anyone, right? That's the condition that you would ask for. Not necessarily, so basically it, 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 it doesn't require the strain, the stringentness of did the, if the tree fell down in the forest, if no one looked right, did it fall down or not? This condition kind of spikes up because the experiment hasn't been, been performed. So it has no results. Observer independent facts could be, can, could, could be used to say, no, okay, we know the tree fell even if no one looked right. So this is a weaker assumption. And if, so the results of looking at where does this break down will be stronger. It'll give you a bigger net that, oh no, okay, these things fail on an even larger scale than this when this, with this stronger condition. Does that make sense? It's kind of like if I have if I have an inequality. Uh, if I have an inequality, I say, okay, you're, you're stuck to everything. Reality is kind of stuck to everything within here according to this. And we say, oh, okay, reality is in fact over here. That's kind of what we're having with Bell's inequality. We're saying, okay, if I wanted nice things, then everything that I would expect should exist here beyond this line. Put him in the center. Yeah. Should exist above this line here. And then Bell, then we experimentally verify, uh-oh, our, our thing is here. Um, what we can do is we can say, oh, okay, I can relax these constraints. And let's say, no, in fact, if I, if I relax what I want, I could be happy if reality were in here. But then I go, right, so, so I can have, I can, I can get closer to I can maybe get closer to matching the real matching the observations that are beyond what I wanted under one set of assumptions if I relax those things, right? Like if if I looked at 
Bell's inequality and said, okay, let's look at Bell's inequality and let's relax locality, right? One of the three, then we know for sure it would look like this. Reality would fall within whatever theory would match that. Right. Right. So the weaker my conditioning, the more of this, um, the more of this theoretical graph here describing theories that could describe reality, right? The more of that I can fill up and say, oh, okay, I can match these empirical results or I can match those empirical results. And the fact that, you know, we kind of get these ones way out from what we would, what, what, uh, a theory with nice properties would allow it's kind of unfortunate well maybe we can maybe we can relax those slightly you know maybe we can relax those a little slightly and then you know to get here you just have to break one of them right it's not about relaxing it's about breaking and so bong relaxes um observer independent facts and relaxes it down to just absoluteness of observed events so if someone observes something then that should be um true, real, and have a single result for anyone, regardless of Okay, that. so we're making an important but subtle distinction. Whereas before we had Observer Independent, which says, uh, I'm going to measure this cup as being mostly transparent, and you're going to measure this cup as being mostly transparent. We do we perform our measurements at different times, so we still come to the same. Right. But now we've relaxed it to say, okay, I have measured this cup to become transparent, or it is transparent, therefore... It is transparent. Uh, yeah. So let's. So that would be the, the. We have to correct the first one. The second one is right. You have okay. the, the 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 absoluteness of observed events would be saying, you have observed that the cup is transparent. Therefore, I should be able to, regardless, no matter what happens later, if I come along and observe it, I will always observe it as being clear. Right. The absoluteness of Observe uh, the 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 observer independent facts would be someone could say it was clear, but no one has actually looked. Therefore, everyone will agree that it's clear. It's kind of it's it's saying, I believe I'm not overstating this uh, when I say it's it's that you know the tree in the forest fell regardless of whether anyone looked. That's the relaxation is to say the the tree. No, no, that's 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 the observer independent facts, right? Because Right, 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 right. It's a fact that the 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 animals heard it, but we'll we'll say they don't count as observers. If we don't count animals right. as observers, it's still the tree fell, and someone will walk along and go, "Oh, look, a tree fell." So now you're saying that the tree actually, we don't know unless somebody was actually there, and we will never know. Right. Okay. We are we are giving up on knowing on knowing the answer to that philosophical question. Does it make a sound if no one was there to observe it? Right. right. Okay. Um. Where th this is kind of sidestepping. It's like, uh, philosophy hard. Let's just say if someone hears it, then everyone agrees that it could be heard. Okay. Yeah. So we haven't actually given any special power to an actual observer. Right. Okay. It's just that you... You leave... Uh, unmade measurements just fuzzy right if there's if there's no way if there's no way that someone could have observed it or did then we won't worry about it then it's absolutely unknowable that whether the tree made a right. sound right okay um yeah so the three things that the three assumptions that bong uses are the absoluteness of observed events he then requires that there's no super determinism and that the theory is local um, and combines those and says, okay, any physical theory that matches these, we will call it locally friendly. Now, in addition to that, what he also opens up is the types of measurements that can be made. And just says, in theory, there's one measurement that the super observer, Alice or Bob, can make, where they look into the box and just verify what their friends make. And then there could be any countable number of other measurements, whether it's an interference thing or... Any other measurement that you could come up with that would be measuring the properties of the system as a whole without like digging in and tearing apart, decoupling the two, um, the friend and the system. That makes sense? It's a lot of words. It is. Uh, so, right, the, the key parts are you have uh, a system that's sending out information, a system that's in a laboratory 
a friend in a laboratory, and then an observer outside that laboratory. So any measurements that the observe that the for, that the person outside Wigner outside the laboratory could make that doesn't separate the the quantum mechanical state of the friend and the system basically anything that doesn't open the box any potential measurement you want to make okay fine as long as it's 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 a countable number it could be an infinite number of choices whether it's an interference matrix a measurement to check whether they are still in superposition or not or anything else that you could come up with that doesn't force the separation because the moment that I open the box, right, I've I've decoupled the I, I've collapsed their their joint wave function. And in a sense, I've decoupled the quantum mechanicsness of the friend and the system. Right? Now if I you know look away, the thing that will be quantum mechanical when looking away will be the quantum mechanical system because the lab is open and free to everything. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah. Um if Yeah. So, so just just in case, you know, limiting yourself to just two different measurements with what uh, Bruckner and um, uh, Proietti were testing, just in case that's a problem, they built the language that says, no, if you have any other number of measurements, we're just going to make sure that that's fine. And they bake this into these, what they call local friendliness requirements. Again, absoluteness of, of observed events, non-super determinism, and locality. And the result, and in a similar way, right, like Bell's, Bell's inequality, right, I can say S has to be less than 2 based on, you know, some distribution that I put in. So this, I could kind of map this like this, right? And that gives me um, a, a shaded area that matches and then a non-shaded area that doesn't, that doesn't match this requirement. Mm -hmm. The moment that I jump up to multiple types of measurements and, um, oh, and they also allow for um, a countable number of like outcomes. So if you had an experiment that didn't just have spin up, spin down, but more, um, then their work works. But let's, but here what they do is they choose three different measurements that are possible looking and then two other, you know, one that's going to be interference and then one that. I don't believe they specify, and then two possible outcomes. So they do have a, a horizontal or vertical result here. Um, so if when I have those those extra conditions, right? Each each of the results that you could have for the different measurements you can make will enact kind of a different line, right? Will enact a different set of conditions that this that that realities that we want that match you know these these three in this case three postulates that are nice right the space that they can fall into kind of gets smaller so if i've you know made this blue line then i need to have right everything under the blue line so now i need to have everything to the left of the white line and everything below the blue line so now the only things i consider instead of you know the whole area is just this subsection of both and what I've started to make for you is a, a polygon, right? Well, it turns out when I make uh, more measurements, I end up with a higher dimensional object. So for... But no closer to the actual result. Right. So so um, because, because what we're going to construct here is something that will visually explain... Um, what do I want to say? Visually explain the difference between... Um, the Bell experiment and this Wigner's friend experiment. Okay, um, so the four uh, they chose three measurements and two, three possible measurement settings and two outcomes. The thing that this creates is a polytope uh, or a polytope, basically just a higher dimensional poly polyhedron potentially with uh, nine hundred and thirty two different faces. Now they can be grouped, um, but it's it's a complicated object but what you can do is you can end up taking slices of it so they take a 2d slice this is quintessential so we'll go ahead and focus on it um yeah, there we go yeah you needing a visual media so this is um 
a particular slice of that polytope with the 932 different faces. Uh, and it can and it shows a clear hierarchy. Now, the the hierarchy that we end up seeing in this picture, uh, the the authors say that it is clear throughout, like it stays the same throughout, regardless of the different settings and different outcomes that you say. Um, and they talk about how to get this slice and uh, how to construct the polytope in the uh, in the supplemental information. But as far as like usually digestible visual information, that's difficult. So we'll just assume that what they tell us that this is quintessential is correct. So uh, you obviously see a weird shape here with a bunch of colors and a red line. So let's go over what these uh, colors are. First off, we have purple, which is NS, which tells us uh, that effectively, if I have quantum entanglement, that when two particles are sent, you know, two galaxies apart, that the information that is shared, that is sent when someone measures over here and can be received by the person over here, actually can't move faster than the speed of light. It's called the no signaling theorem. Uh, it's a theorem that says, no, 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 even even though you have the spooky action at a distance, the amount of information content that you can send uh, doesn't go faster than the speed of light. It's a weird kind of workaround. Uh, it also means that, you know, that that Star Trek dream of having a communicator that just works off of entangled bits doesn't work. Boo. Anyways, um, right. Although there's a small chance. <laughs> um, next, what we have is the yellow, the local friendliness. Those are the ones that basically are quintessential of the Vigner's friend experiment that we talked about. And then uh, last is green, which is local hidden variables. And then that red line is Q. So it just represents the results that you get, the maximal results you get when you are looking at a quantum mechanical system. You can, you can choose any psi that you want for, um, for this, this setup, any rotation of the photon that you want. Here's the S that it gives you. And you'll notice that it goes somewhere in between no signal theorem and uh, solidly outside of the green and largely outside of the local hidden variables. Um, so what this tells you is that there's a hierarchy in these, which is that, um, well, the things that are inside are more restricted than the things that are outside. So the most restricted is the local hidden variables. If you break, if you, if you choose a, a if you try to create a theory right that has, that fills local hidden variables it will or if you if you find a theory that violates uh the yeah that violates the 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 inequality that s inequality that we had right for the local hidden variable setup then you will violate the local friendliness and the no signaling if but you can have right local friendly theories that actually, um, when you violate them, don't violate the local hidden variable. Or wait, excuse me, no, that's the other, the wrong way around. There are, there are systems out there that violate local friendliness, but do not violate local hidden variables. Right, so the moment I find, the moment I find uh, a... So, so effectively what, what happens is, is when I add in um, the absoluteness of observed events, I have a looser set of conditions than just the set of conditions that I had when I'm looking at uh, a local hidden variable theory. Okay, so unpack this a little bit so we can start to piece that realization together just from looking at this diagram. Mm -hmm. So the red line indicates every possible value that we could have observed from the previous experiment? Effectively. Okay. Yeah. The uh, for, from, from the quantum mechanical bit of the experiment, yes. Okay. The green section represents every possible value that fits within a local hidden variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm noticing that it's completely contained by the red. Yes. Which indicates... So, I know you just explained it, but what, what exactly does that indicate again? So you can find quantum mechanical systems... 
that are within local hidden variables, but I can also change my settings so that they are outside and break. Um, okay, so what we're saying is, is that so far, or there is no local hidden variable theory that explains all possible outcomes. Yes, there's there's no there's no local hidden variable theory that can inca that can fully encapsulate the quantum mechanical results. Okay, so now a little more complicated. The no signaling theorem only seems to be able to explain a very small subset of the possible results. Uh, oh, I, I should point out these things are nested. So, um, but are visually so so purple encapsulates literally the, all of this, just all of it. Purple is lying underneath all of it. Um, oh, okay. And then here. So what's the Z ordering? Is purple on the bottom and then yeah. orange is next? And then finally green is on orange top? Orange is there, and then green finally is here. Okay, so then by looking at this... Right, so if I say, oh, okay, then a theory that gives me an S value here, right, that would be, that would be locally a hidden variable theory. It would be fine being described by local hidden variables. It would be fine being locally friendly, having absolute observed events, and it would be fine not having not uh having no no wow how would i phrase that yeah being a no signal theory a no superluminal signal theory okay so actually what we're seeing here is that the only thing that holds true is that no signaling right whereas all these other ones right no are signaling, not descriptive completely yeah no no signaling can um capture all of quantum mechanics so i can have i can have a theory that says, no, 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 you're not allowed to send superluminal signals even through entangled states. And it fully contains all the results of quantum mechanics. Now, this isn't no superluminal getting into the whole causality thing with wormholes and things like that. This is only in terms of sending information over entanglement yes. faster than the speed of light. Yes, I believe that. I believe that's okay. what that's saying. Yes. Okay. Uh, to be fair, I didn't dive deep too deep into that particular paper. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, because yeah, because that was that was um, one of the things that they were you know looking at when they had spooky action. This was oh my goodness, like are we going to have superluminal communication that breaks everything? That breaks everything as far as relativity is concerned. Yeah, so causality. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now I now I fully comprehend this. No good. Yeah. So it's so it's an important picture to like. Sorry. I, yeah, yeah. Z ordering is important. I should have specified that earlier. But yeah. So this picture basically tells us yeah uh it, since bell's theorem was only concerned with you know super determinism uh locality and uh free will right then when i add in uh if if removing locality right for example from your theory was enough to solve this then when i add in observer independent or absoluteness of uh, observed events then if removing locality from that set of assumptions was good enough to solve it then the line i should see no yellow beyond what green is right when i add basically what this is telling me is that when i add in uh, absoluteness of observed events the requirement that if someone observes something everyone can agree on that thing happening uh, is more sensitive than just what removing locality can predict. I believe is what we're saying. Okay. Right? Uh, which means it's it's a it's a fundamentally different and important problem beyond just having fuzzy, potentially non-local behavior, right? Because we know we have non-local behavior. It's just here, right? No signaling means that we just can't break See, basically causality with that. Throwing out basically all four. Of those things that you listed previously. Yeah. Uh, one of those four things has to go, right? One of those four things has to go in order to explain, right? Be be because of Wigner's friend basically being true. In order, in order to explain quantum mechanics, you have to let go of one of those things to create a theory, right? Basically, quantum mechanics can't simultaneously have those four things. Can we go back to those four things real quick? Yeah way up here right so basically what this is saying is that quantum mechanics cannot have these four things simultaneously one of them has to go uh otherwise it's it's a paradox in your result okay so and then bell's theorem told us you know if i get rid of that 
one of those things has to go. Okay. Right. But because the that picture, right, because the the conditions on local friendliness are a superset of the conditions on uh, local hidden variables, it means that when I add a new condition, it actually is more sensitive, right? So getting rid of locality wouldn't solve this this problem either. That makes sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so which one, do we know any of those are definitely true? Because it seemed to me from that diagram, the only thing that we know is true is no signaling. The only or non signaling. Yeah. The only the only basically I can come up with a theory that has no signaling as an assumption and quantum mechanics is fine. Right? That be, that not quantum mechanics is fine. Is that I can reproduce the results that I would see in quantum mechanics. And I know that, you know, we, we know that empirically the results we see match with quantum mechanics. So because the first basic assumption we take is that the data is real, that's going to be our guiding post for what is reality. Whatever I measure, I'm going to treat as the guiding light. And the measurements that I see from quantum mechanics are extremely accurate to the data. So any theory I come up with better be able to explain the results of quantum mechanics. Right. Right. And no signaling theories. There are theories you can make a note that, that have no superluminal signals, and those are fine. Right? According to Bell, argu Bell arguments, you can have that assumption. So it's basically relativity. Yeah. As long as it agrees with the relativity, it's fine. You can have, you can have no superluminal travel, and things are fine. Well, uh, it's still, what do I want to say? Um, there has to be a slight difference because of locality being a thing. The distinction between locality and no signaling, I think it has to do, well, yeah, as it, basically you can't have super luminal um, transportation because, because if you get rid of locality, you actually aren't exactly agreeing with um, relativity. And that was what, uh, that's what bothered Einstein. Right, right, right. But, it, right, but we, we've have, already determined, though, that entanglement doesn't actually transfer information faster than light. Right. Even though the effect occurs yes. faster than the speed of so light. So you can have an effect that is outside your light cone, but the information that that right. effect came from outside your light cone can't travel back faster than the speed of light. Right. Or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Weird, subtle point, but it turns out it's important. Sure, definitely. Right. And now we finally get to uh, that paper that I kind of opened up part one with, which was Bruckner, which was that 2018 paper that first brought me on this, which was uh, from Frauchinger and Renner, where they were talk, where they were talking um, about how using similar arguments to the to Bell type reasoning, although it's more formal logic form, so not my greatest forte, so we'll leave it off there. But basically that single world interpretations of quantum mechanics cannot be self uh, consistent. So Bruckner actually goes through and addresses this and says, um, in particular, uh, the, the implications of their self consisting requirements are equivalent to those of a theoretical framework in which the truth value of the observational statements by Wigner and Wigner's friend can jointly be assessed and then whether they are consistent or not verified. So basically the conditions of whether quantum mechanics can consistently explain itself with a single world, everything collapses down to this is the result and this is what the world sees, is equivalent to this extended Wigner's friend setup. And in the view of the no-go theorem, it's it, it in general need not be it need not be possible in a physical theory to do this if the theory can operate only with facts relative to the observer. So if I give up absoluteness, then I don't have to worry about consistency of quantum mechanics. Right. Okay, so the implications of this, uh, correct me where I'm wrong here. So you're saying that A, the many worlds theorem has to be, is more, we've ruled out any theorem that doesn't include a many worlds interpretation. No. Okay. No, not quite yet. Okay. Now it's a way that we could test, um, but... 
what we would have to figure out is how do we describe results with, we, we have to account for the fact that measurement results are relative to the observer okay so that was, was making them that was might be so we can okay. get around requiring many worlds if we say that there is no such thing as absolute truth absoluteness to who has observed what um now so let us jump to that let me make sure yeah um well, well in fact We'll get to that in a bit. So, okay. Um, another popular way, right? We talked about um, the four things that you could do to get rid of, right? That you had these four things. You have to drop one of them. Um, for Bell inequalities, like Bell's theorem, one of the possible ways was getting rid of outcome independence, right? Which was okay. The the outcome of your experiments, they can be maybe tangled together. Um, maybe there's some amount of speed, and that allows you to maintain locality and no super determinism. But just like what we were talking about, how this extends a bit beyond uh, just Bell's theorem, right? This theorem shows that that particular strategy doesn't extend to solving this problem. I can't get rid of outcome independence, um, right? To to actually solve my problem, because if local friendliness uh, were to be violated to maintain the locality and no super determinism, I would have to reject the absoluteness of observer, uh, the absoluteness of observed events. Um, so uh, now one of the, the, the last thing that I think I'll particularly bring up is that you could look at this and say, well, okay, we're using photons here. We know that photons, we have verified directly that photons deal with quantum mechanics. Right, they're they're very quantum mechanical, so like, there's no way it's past the smoky dragon, right? So maybe there's some split that we haven't seen. Maybe you know we get big enough that it does. Maybe at ninety photons. Yeah, right. right. A fully convincing demonstration would require a strong justification for the attribution of a fact to the photons measurement. Um, now, of course, that count that really depends on what counts as an observer. Because conducting this kind of experiment with human beings is physically impractical. What do we learn from experiments with simpler friends? Right, is a question they raise. They argue, well, as far as our theory is able to concern, right, we really don't have a reason to distinguish it, so it would be a hard point. As actually Bell himself, uh, pulling from uh, one of Bruckner's earlier papers, uh, Bell sardonically commented, what exactly qualifies some physical system to play the role of measurer? Was the wave function of the world waiting to jump for thousands of millions of years until a single-celled living creature appeared? Or did it have to wait a little longer for some better qualified system with a PhD? Right. So if clearly the world has evolved with, without us, why would you know something better than a photon be any more reasonable if it can measure if it can record a measurement it makes than someone with a phd there's no particular need to specify this well not without getting into anthropomorphism and other types of things like right. that um we could maybe if we could devise a way of seeing where exactly those quantum mechanics start to break down then that would be an interesting that would be something like an objective collapse theory where you can talk about exactly what level of scale of complexity does it take in order for a system to just say no no, no quantum mechanics is broken right right because obviously the the original Wigner's thought process really relied upon a, a you know, human sized observer but if we're willing to say anything that can measure and record a system and that's going to be relevant because you know you could have We'll have quantum computing. We'll have AI that might be able to work on a small enough chip, but it's still quantum mechanical, right? We can still just like scale up these friends as we go along, but uh, yeah. Well, okay. So have we found any experimental bounds or, or have we determined a way to figure out where this, this threshold is if it exists? Like, is there anybody out there that you know of that is saying, okay, well, look, we're going to devise an experiment that we do it this time, and then we do it this time, we'll know if it's 50 photons, 100 photons, 1,000 photons. Oh, actually, it's unlimited photons, which means it could be any sized observer. Like, where, what what work 
is being done to actually try and determine if that threshold exists. So as far as I have seen, no one is aiming to answer quite that um, quite that question because it's 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 hard to be able to measure quantum mechanical effects and, and observe. Like we know, like for example, we know that you and like you and I don't feel quantum mechanical effects, right? You look very solid. I can tell exactly where you are. Right. I think from your perspective, I don't seem that fuzzy. But the 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 question of how do we build experiments that can exhibit quantum mechanical processes and or superpositions and then figure out oh we've broken this oh we've broken this uh, it's a difficult process it really is now there is some work on modifying right there 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 are proposals because this really does fall down to how does the world choose the result that we see when we make a quantum mechanical measurement? And by what process do we end up there? Um, there are plenty of attempts to say, okay, if we can't have these four things, let's figure out a theory to let go of one of them and um, explain what happens. And actually, in a paper that just came out a few, month, uh, a few months ago this year, there's potentially a way to make the argument that, you know what, we can just say things are relative, both on the large scale and on the small scale. And I think I'll leave that for the next part. All right. Any other questions? Well, it's, it's funny because when we started this, I thought we were going to get into something very philosophical. But so far, really, I don't think we've totally delved into philosophy yet. Because we're dealing with still such small systems. And I think most people who are watching this, even other scientists, could be like, all right, look, look, look. I definitely, I get it with the photons, but we're so far removed from that that they're, they're just thinking engineering-wise, technolo technology-wise, math-wise. Is there oh, any yeah. possible way we could scale this even up to a gerbil? Probably not. Oh, no. Like, yeah. The, the, so the, the, the amount of care, right? Okay, so actually, you know what? The people who would who would be and who you would probably be looking for to at what point do things get so uh, massive that quantum mechanics starts to break down would be quantum computing, right? The quantum computing is the the method by which we break the fact that quantum mechanics does things that classically we can't explain in order to reach results much faster than classical computers can do. In theory, yeah. Well, we don't know if quantum supremacy is actually true yet. I thought we. You know, uh, this is that's beyond. But that's the premise we offer, right? Right. right. The idea is that if, in theory we we could create a machine that is able to do that. But the, like their their pursuit of creating bigger and bigger machines, this would exactly be the limit, right? How big can you make a quantum computer? And finding that process, you know, the process of finding that limiting size. Mm. Yeah, that would be the end result. Okay. Is knowing exactly exactly where quantum mechanics break down, or if it ever does, if we make an AI that's the size of you or me, that's just like got a quantum brain, and you're like, I don't know where what any what's happening on anything inside there. That'd be pretty neat. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, no. So a lot of the phys philosophical stuff is going to end up being in these different interpretations of, you know, how does the world choose what we see, or does it even choose? Right. Right. Yep. And I think we'll address that next time, but definitely I wanted to get through before we even started talking about the philosophy of these implications, we would need to have a ground rule of, hey, this is this stuff is broken. We know that it's not fully explaining everything. So we need to have the we need to think about what's actually happening, right? The process of creating a better picture of what's happening. Well, that's pretty awesome. We got through three hours and I didn't even really notice it. <laughs> good job, man. Oh, yeah. All right. We cool. good? Yeah.